Jewish? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Bradenton City Council meeting. Wednesday, April 13th, 2022 at 8.30 a.m. As always, we are going to start with a prayer and a pledge. This time, I don't believe our pastor is here yet. Um, so we'll ask Miss Barnaby if she wouldn't mind giving us the prayer this morning. Please stand. Please join me in our invocation. O creator of us all in this season of renewal, renew our commitment to thoughtful listening and productive discussions for our community. We ask blessings on our city, state, and country. Watch over our military here and abroad. Please protect all of our city employees, especially those who put themselves in harm's way to protect us. And together, let the people say, Amen. Amen. You please join us in the pledge. Pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation, under God, indivisible, with, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. This time we'll call the meeting to order. Mrs. Melton. We have a proclamation this morning for Suncoast Remake Learning Days, April 29th through May 8th, 2022. Whereas the Suncoast Campaign for Grade Level Reading is a four county effort in Manatee, Charlotte, DeSoto, and Sarasota counties to help children from birth through third grade, especially those from asset limited families, succeed in life by ensuring they read on grade level. And whereas the Patterson Foundation works collaboratively with people, businesses, nonprofits, government, and the media to provide engaging educational experiences that will foster community-wide participation. Remake Learning Days Across America is a 10-day festival that celebrates the many learning opportunities in our community. The events are free and focus on providing educational experiences for youth, pre-K through high school. And whereas when learning is engaging, learners have the time, resources, support, environment, and encouragement to be active problem solvers, creators, innovators, advocates, and citizens. And whereas Remake Learning Days provides experiential learning opportunities that will engage children, <coughs> parents, and families outside of classroom hours and school buildings. Learning isn't limited to the classroom, Rather, it's something that can happen in any place or time. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Jean Brown, as mayor of the city of Bradenton, Florida, do hereby proclaim April 29th through May 8th, 2022, as Suncoast Remake Learning Days in Bradenton, and urges families to continue providing positive learning experiences for our children by participating in this special event. Signed, Jean Brown, Mayor. Thank you. Do we have someone to come forward and accept this proclamation? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Beth Judah. I'm with the Patterson Foundation and the director of the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. And on behalf of all of the folks that are working with us, I want to thank you for your support of this inaugural year of the Sun Coast Remake Learning Days. We are working with more than 165 organizations across our four county region. And there are more than 150 free educational events for parents and children to participate in between April 29th and May the 8th. We are so proud of the collaborative spirit of everyone working on this project. And we look forward to continue to strengthen the educational ecosystem in our region and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Can you turn around and Jeannie will want to get a picture of you there? Thank you, thank you for all you do. This time I do have another proclamation that I'm going to read at this point. Um, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Bradenton, I do hereby issue this proclamation honoring National Public Safety Telecommunications Week, which is April 10th through the 16th, 2022. Whereas emergencies can occur at any time that require police, fire, or emergency medical services. 
Whereas, when an emergency occurs, the prompt response of police officers and firefighters is critical to the protection of life and preservation of property. Whereas, the safety of our police officers and firefighters is dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained from citizens who telephone, telephone the City of Bradenton Emergency Communication Center. Whereas, public safety telecommunicators are the first and most critical contact our citizens have with emergency services. <coughs> Whereas they are a vital link for our police officers and firefighters by monitoring their activities by radio, providing them information, and ensuring their safety. Whereas public safety telecommunicators of the Bradenton Police Department have contributed substantially to the apprehension of criminals, su suppression of fires, and treatment of patients. Each dispatcher, dispatcher continually exhibits compassion, understanding, and professionalism during the performance of their job. Now, therefore, it be it resolved that I, Gene Brown, as mayor of the city of Bradenton, Florida, do hereby proclaim April 10th through 16th, 2022, as National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week in Bradenton in honor of the men and women whose diligence and professionalism keep our city and citizens safe. Thank you. Chief? Mayor, thank you very much. Um, council as well. Uh, I think you said it all in that proclamation. Um, these folks, day in, day out, do um, a job that many of us can't even imagine, listening to just things some could never uh, understand over a phone, and, and not necessarily being able to get out there and, and save the day, but, but helping our officers get out there and, and save the day. I often write to them in their birthday cards that um, they're the true ones out there keeping our officers and our firefighters safe. They are that lifeline to them. And um, I'd like to have manager Brad Myers come up and say a few words. Uh, you didn't meet him last year. Um, he's new. And then I'll let Chief Gear, who equally shares, I'm sure, my adoration towards them, I'll let him finish it out. So Brad. Definitely thank you for your support. Uh, it can be a thankless job a lot of the times, but uh, we just like being in a light in our community's darkness whenever they, they need our help. So thank you. He, he spoke of that really, really well, but uh, Brad does an excellent job at, over at dispatch and has helped us uh, for many years. And these dispatchers are often, <coughs> I think you all know the, the voice where, you know, we're, we're in the dark and they are the true lifeline. I'd say they uh, get the phone calls and complaints from us sometimes, and then they also uh, take the, the interesting calls from the public and uh, have to cipher all that and have it make sense for us. So, um, you know, just the other day, they led us to a patient that was out in the woods and kind of hard to find. And, and uh, so they do an excellent job, and we can't say enough about y'all and that you guys are truly that voice that uh, keeps us calm in, in, in some bad situations. Uh, but we also appreciate all the good too, so which outweighs it. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm joined here today by uh, a number of our staff and if they can stand up as well. And if can we you can bring them give, up also. Okay, and if um, we can all just collectively give all of our dispatchers who couldn't really be here today because they're on the radio right now and, and Brad who manages them just a round of applause. We're so proud of them. So let's let's ask any council members have anything they want to say before I say something, buddy. Okay. What what I would like to just say is, is um, obviously I had an emergency several weeks ago with my son, and um, the place that we went to obviously called 911 and and got the ambulance and the firefighters there, and it was in the city. Um, and I think when you have an, a situation that happens where you're on that phone or you hear somebody on that phone and the panic is there you know that, that the people behind that don't get any credit for anything, but they are the ones that are actually truly starting what's happening. And uh, you know, I think this, the citizens and the community doesn't realize that all the time, but you know, we've got a lot of heroes and, and the telecommunicators are that first step in it. So we appreciate from as a citizens and as, as people that have had things happen, thank you for what you do. So appreciate it. Yep.
flowers for him. <laughs> they are pretty. Maybe for me. Spring. Spring. Did you do it? Did you do it? <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, Mrs. Melton, any presentations? No, sir. All right. We'll go to citizen comment. At this time, citizen comment will be accepted on non-agenda items. So comments will be accepted on public hearing and agenda items at that appropriate time. As you know, you'll have three minutes. And please, when I call your name, come forward and uh, state your name, address, and you'll have three minutes. OK, first we have Susie Copeland. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and Council. I'm here this morning really to appeal to City Council your hearts and minds that you will consider, as the Bible says, the least of these. We're in a city with roughly 50,000 residents. And with these residents, all of them may or may not have the advantages that some of us may have. We're not all living the American dream. People are suffering with the rising cost of housing, their increase in their rents that have gone up substantially within the last year. Our gas prices have skyrocketed. Our grocery bills have gone up. Our medical bills have gone up, and the list can go on. And I'm appealing to you this morning. I think Councilman Sanders mentioned this at the last city council meeting, that we take a portion of our relief dollars and designate for affordable housing. Our homeless population has grown substantially in the last year, especially during COVID, where people are losing their housing. They don't have the money to pay their rents. They can't afford to buy a home because of the high rising cost of housing. <coughs> and I'm asking city council to consider seriously looking after these people. They are residents of the city of Bradenton and we have to take care of them. So I'm asking, please consider doing something in the city of Bradenton for affordable housing. People talk about affordable housing, but those who are on limited income, and I think the United Way uh, framed it well, Alice population. That's what people are experiencing here in the city of Bradenton. And you guys have the power to make a difference, improve the quality of life for an Alice family. So I ask you, please, determine within your minds that we're going to do serious work to address affordable housing so that people will be able to have safe, decent housing that they can't afford. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, next we have David Levin. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome, and please state your name and address for the record. David Levin, 105 22nd Street West. Bradenton, Florida, 34205. Thank you, Mayor, City Council, Rob, Scott. Um, I came here today to talk about BPD uniforms um, and the psychological effects they might have on the people. Now, they do a lot of good work, right? But we wouldn't want that work to be diminished because they're looking a little too intimidating. And frankly, I think, you know, the black uniforms are a little intimidating. If you look at um, studies like the Stanford Pretty Prison Experiment, those uniforms have a psychological effect on the people wearing them and the people who are interacting with them. And the dark colors and the militant kind of look to it, um, I think it could be, uh, it, it could cause maybe perceptions of, not corruption, but, all, but maybe intimidation and coercion, and maybe at worst corruption. So I, I would ask the council today to consider maybe changing the uniform, I'm not sure if this is the right place to come for this, but maybe there's some influence, right, to uh, change the uniform, lighten them up. 
I mean, black in Florida doesn't really make a lot of sense to wear on a daily basis unless they're like absorbing the sun and their solar panels. <laughs> so I think that maybe a green or a tan might be a better fit for these uniforms here in Bradenton, Florida. I, maybe they want to soften the image up a little bit, but I think something needs to be done because there's a subset of the community that doesn't feel safe around BPD. I, I, I can illustrate it right now by just taking off my uh, jacket. I mean, this might be a little more intimidating than say just like a pink shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so th this might soften my image up and you might think, okay, this guy's not as uh, intimidating. You can talk to him a little better. I don't know, that's just me. Um, another perception I wanted to talk about briefly was the sell-off of City Hall, which I'm not 100% against yet. I don't have all the facts. I would have liked to go to the workshop. Um, so if there's a reschedule on that, I'd like to, you know, if you could put it out there, that'd be great. Um, but there's also the perception, right, that it, because we work with a land use firm, that that's what's driving this. And I just want to illustrate, maybe if we worked with, like, a, a firm that specialized in railroad law, we'd have a more centric policy on, I don't know, the, the state of the railroads that run through Bradenton, which are kind of dilapidated. There's huge chunks of concrete and stuff. But that's just to illustrate the point that maybe, you know, we're letting the law firm and their, uh, their specialization drive this, uh, this idea, which isn't necessarily the worst idea. But like I said, I just, as a citizen, I'd like to see the workshops and um, the workshop rescheduled on the uh, selling off City Hall. And that's, uh, that's my time. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Next we have Steve, and is it Despot? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Come forward. Please state your name and your address for the record. Uh, my name is Steve Despot, 13928 Messina Loop, Bradenton, Florida. And I'm here to talk to you about the bus benches that Metropolitan Bus Company or Bench Company has put out. I handed out a uh, photo for you to look at. There are 85 bus stops eastbound and westbound on Manatee Avenue between Morgan Johnson Road and 75th Street West. MCAT has installed a bus shelter, a bus bench, or a seat at every stop. But along Manatee Avenue, Metropolitan System, now owned by Creative Outdoor, has 15 advertising benches next to an MCAT shelter. 40 advertising benches next to an MCAT bench, 15 advertising benches next to an MCAT seat, and three benches that aren't even at a bus stop for a total of 73 benches. And this does not count their advertising benches on Cortez, 26th Street West, 14th Street, or 51st Street West that are also next to MCAT shelters, <coughs> benches, and seats. Metro Bench has maintained these benches in the city of Bradenton for over 50 years, operating via a proposal dated March 29, 1971. This document is a proposal and has never been converted to a contract or a lease. The proposal was signed by the mayor and city clerk. Definition of a proposal is a plan or suggestion put forward for consideration or discussion. There is also an addendum to the 1971 proposal, but it is not dated, not signed by the mayor or the city clerk, and nor approved by the city attorney. Nonetheless, whether this proposal constitute a legal binding agreement between the city of Bradenton and Metro Bench Company, paragraph seven of that proposal says, and I quote, the city shall reserve the right to exclude any particular section of its corporate limits from the placement of said benches. Paragraph seven goes on to say, and I quote, further, the city shall reserve the right upon notice to the company order to remove, order the removal of any particular bench which the city in its good judgment believes not to be located to the public benefit. I <coughs> contend that these benches are redundant being situated next to a shelter, a bench, or a seat and they don't serve a public benefit anymore. Thank you. Appreciate it. Your time is up. Okay. Thank you. Next would be Rodney Jones. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Rodney Jones, 213 16th Avenue West. Uh, I've been to every meeting this year, uh, January, February, and April. 
uh, trying to get a meeting with the mayor. I've emailed him. I'm not sure if it's because I'm black or a black community. Several black community members would like to meet with you. We've asked to meet with you. Uh, you continue not to uh, make arrangements for us to meet. Um, I think it is an issue of race at this point because we have complaints about the police department. Um, I continue to say there's misconduct in the police department, right in the police department, we have discovered it. The only thing we want to do is just present that information to you since you are the person that fought to be over the police department and were not supportive of the referendum that we had to spread that responsibility out over the council. So you're the dude, so we need you to be the dude. You wanted to lead, you wanted to be Big Papa, we need you to be Big Papa and meet with the community so we can talk to you. I, I appreciate Patrick Roth, you actually lied in a meeting, we have you on video lying. You changed the whole public, uh, public uh, speaking section, you changed it in midstream in the middle of a meeting and Patrick called you on it, you basically lied. And so not only have you lied to keep us from getting our point out, now you're refusing to meet with black community members. It's just four of us, myself, Alfonso Houston, that came and he said he heard Josh admit that those officers lied to him. We have Ruth Beltran, who's a federal investigator uh, from the Department of Labor. She did the investigation for me to add some credibility to it. She found misconduct. We have all the documentation. We just like to sit down with it and present it to you. So is there somebody here? Also, I'd like to engage your advisory board that doesn't have any teeth. That You have no oversight over your police department right now. Melanie is it. So Melanie can basically go back there and do whatever she wants to do, lie and concoct and do whatever she wants to do and get away with it. And the only thing we're asking, the black community is asking, is to meet with you. Um, can I talk to somebody about setting that meeting up? Or you usually tell people, oh, go talk to so-and-so, but you never tell me. So I'd like to know who do I talk to about setting that meeting up. It'll be Betty Lou Rose, Alfonso Houston, myself, and Ruth Beltran. Are you finished with citizen comment? Yeah, I'm done. I want to I hear well, if you're done, we'll have you sit down and then we'll no, make I'm, comments. I'm not done. I want to hear it, man. You, okay, you're a got, joke. You're a joke. Your leadership, is, time, your so. leadership is poor. You, you're afraid. You're afraid to hear the truth. You want certain segments of the community are ostracized and we don't have the same access as others. And those are civil rights like, uh, legis those are civil rights issues. So I'm not coming here for nothing every meeting. What I'm doing is providing my efforts from the black community to reach out to our mayor when we have a problem. And what you're showing us is that you're not interested in the meeting with us and that's a problem. And you've shown it in front of all of these people. Marianne's been sitting there looking crazy, hasn't said anything. Bill, yeah, I'm talking about you. You know, and this guy back here, David Levin, he's sounding better and better all the time. He is, so I hope you don't put your name in the run because your husband's gonna kill you over in Palmetto with the conduct that he's caught up in. Thank Waiting you. to hear from you, Mayor. Yes, sir, thank Power. you. All right, is, I have no other cards for citizen comment. All right. Any council comment? Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. I've always been curious about these, uh, the gentleman that brought up the, the, the bench signs. Um, that, uh, Mr. Jones, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Mr. Jones, can you please stay till all the comments are made so you can hear everything that's said? You. Yes, sir. You're going to. Go ahead. I'm sorry to um, interrupt you, Mr. Ross. That's all right. Uh, well, anyway, these, these things have, have kind of uh, bugged me the whole time, and I know we're, there was talk of a lawsuit, and there was, uh, you know, moving around of uh, what we're doing with them. and every, what, What's the legal status of these? Because the, the gentleman said we don't have a contract. Is that, yeah, is that, I, is that true? I remember a couple years ago when you and I were on the council together yeah. here. Um, I think it was, we were the only two still here at that point. Yeah. It was brought up, and I've asked Mr. Rudisell... Uh, some to look into that even before this so I'm glad this gentleman brought it up today because it's something that we continue to get but I think Mr. Lish was still the attorney at the time that was talked it's, about it's been, it's been talked and about so it needs to be addressed where and I know Mr. McCollum has been involved in it so I think it's something really that needs to be taken a good look at and see what we what teeth we have to do with it because I agree with it so so my, my comment on this is they've always looked trashy they 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 do i mean the, the county has provided um you know a, a, a uniform bus thing and and they're just it's redundant it's 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 low class it's uh you know it's 1969 technology um you know i just and i know that we've always said well we're, we're afraid to take them on why are we why are we kowtowing to these people 
the law, I guess, and that's what we can get I, Mr. Rudisell to, to do. Because there was a lawsuit in Gainesville. That's what's talked about back then when it was talked about. So again, I agree that if there's a bus stop bench that the county has now put in, that it doesn't need an advertising bench next to it. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, uh, Mr. Yes. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, aren't all these bus stops the county uh, serviced? And it wouldn't that be under the county contractual agreements, not us? I what? mean, I don't know what we did in 1971, but I don't even know if we had to, there's probably been a lot more bus stops put in since that time. Is that even our property or our regulatory uh, ability to regulate that? Well, the, the county bus stops are, are a different situation. I mean, I think the comment is, and my recollection, because I know we did look at this at, at one point um, and looked at the city's contractual rights. The, the issue is, that they're putting benches or maintaining benches in areas where they're not needed because you've already got an MCAT facility. And so I know we had talked in the past about the potential to go to them under even our existing contract and say, hey, you need to, you need to move the benches from these areas. Um, so that, that's something we can circle back so is around. Is that code enforcement to do that? Or who, who? No, no, that's going to be probably public works directly with the with the folks from, well, I don't remember the name of the company. Can we find out if we even got a contract? But I, mean, I guess after 50 years, if you say nothing, you probably have one, right? I, I don't. I don't, I, I don't know either, but if I, I know, let Jim probably I know that's been a, a big problem if you mm -hmm. allow your neighbor to take your land and mow your grass for 50 years, and he's got a, you've, you obviously didn't say nothing until now, until sell time, so I don't know. Well, the, as the gentleman indicated, the, the contract was, or the, the company that did the Metropolitan Benches was purchased by Creative Outdoors. And they had come to us um, prior to COVID and had wanted to renegotiate the contract with us so that they could spend some money and upgrade them to make them look nicer to be a more um, modern bench, if you will. Um, that kind of went by the wayside when COVID came in we're certainly ready to get back with them and start the process over. There is also, the city has done in the past, the most recent one was I think about three years ago where um, Keep Manti Beautiful came to us and asked for the benches to be removed from the Palmasola Causeway. Um, we, we passed that through you folks. Um, they were told to remove them, they removed them. So that, that is in there to be able to do that. Um, but the ones along Manatee Avenue, it's, it's in the DOT right of way where all of those MCAT bus stops are at. And so theirs are in the DOT. And we've talked to DOT and you, you yeah, may or may not get anywhere sometimes when you do that. So, so it sounds like we don't have any authority there, yeah. really. But the, the other aspect of the existing agreement, if you will, is that it doesn't have a, a, a closeout. Mm -hmm. It's an automatic um, renewal. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that we wanted to get with them when we renegotiate a contract to say, well, we, we got to get all this taken them. care of. So <laughs> we'll, and Jim, we'll be happy to get back with them. Deal. Jim, you and I have had <coughs> many, 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 oh, many, many, many yes. conversations about this. Yes. Um, I've had conversations with LK Nadam, our secretary for the DOT here in this district. Um, I actually had a meeting gosh, I don't know, several months ago with the new company, and they brought in two very nice gentlemen with the Lions Eye Bank because that's who they donate to with some of the income off of this, and I explained to them exactly, basically what was explained and we've talked about today, and that um, if they, wa they wanted to make concrete pads and put the yes. benches, the metal benches with the advertising on it, and I said to them, I said, well, if it's at a bus stop bench right now, then there's a bus stop by what I understand the contract is, you can't put another one, you have to eliminate it. Well, that eliminated 74 or 78 of their advertising benches, and they've never called back. Right. So, you know, it's not been something that hasn't been worked on, but, you know, we were trying to do it, and, and again, I've even asked you at times to say, Jim, this is an advertising bench in the line of sight. In our contract, I believe we could go pick it up and take it because that's in the contract. We've had probably half a dozen 
businesses or homeowners that was on their property, even though it was the right of way, if the homeowner calls you and says, sends a letter, you can take it up. Right. So this has not been something that has just been not addressed, but in masses with the DOT, that's where the masses are. Yeah, so I guess if we want to, as a council, yeah. do something and then we can have our attorney draw something up in a way that would look good to go to the DOT and say, hey, if, it's, if there's a bus stop there with a, D, uh, with a county bus stop, mm -hmm. are we willing to maybe get into a legal battle mm -hmm. and are we willing to then financially support that? Gainesville, Patrick, I think you remember, Gainesville spent about $160,000 if I'm not mistaken, is what we were told. It was in the six digits to fight something and lost. So I'd want to get the information that we know that. So, yes, sir. Mr. Well, I, I, Patrick's. I, I, um, so, well, here's my take on it. So we have a contract that dates 1970. This bench looks like it was made in 1970. Um, so, you know, we have authority over our jurisdiction. And, you know, this has been kicked around. I, I mean, I guess this is something I'd like to go ahead and address before I uh, retire here because it's just been, we get kicked around. It's always the threat of uh, a lawsuit, blah, 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 blah. Well, we in the city <coughs> of Reagan are always going to get sued. We know that. It's, it's, we're going to get sued from people walking down the street, people <coughs> driving a car, people flying over the air. I mean, it's just, you know, we're, we're a target. Um, these things are an eyesore. They're... They're redundant, and I mean they're advertising. We have sign, uh, we have sign ordinances, we have code. I mean, I, I think I, I'd like to see us go ahead and take a shot at at, at eliminating these things. It's just, uh, you know, this isn't the first time it's come up in my 16 years here, and and I I, I just hate I, I just hate to keep kicking this can down the road. They're 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 unattractive. We're spending billions of dollars to make our city appealing. And we're hanging on to a 1970 reject, you know? <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, Mr. Russo, did you have something? No, we can, we can look at the city's options and, and bring that back. All right. All right. Thank you. Did Mr. Sanders have something no, else to add? Oh. All right. Um, so moving on, um, one of the things that I did want to address, and I will be talking about it, at lunchtime, but why Mrs. Copeland is here, I really appreciate you bringing that up because that's been something that we've been talking about. It was very important to talk about it at our city county uh, positive meeting that we had a few weeks back. Um, but one of the things I, I've really done some research on is city contributions and what the city has done over the last several years to do attainable, affordable workforce housing. And, and there's a lot of different of, of uh, definitions of what you're saying and, and I know we even have some you know with Braden Village in the near future met with some people yesterday talking about the different ways to to rehab the that's there plus there's property to add more housing there um, we've done a lot I know in um, um, the housing authority you know that again there's been a lot of conversations about that 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 is talking about remodeling there and and you know there's a lot of land there with little housing so it's going to be where, you know, they're going to try to double, triple the housing that can be there to help people in, in these markets. Obviously, nothing happens as fast as I would like, and I know this council would like in government, but one of the things that we've done is when you look at city contributions, you know, there's been some words out there that the city has done nothing, but the city has done well over five and a half plus million dollars over the last couple of years to contribute to affordable workforce housing and it's a total units of about 681. That's not that many, but it's a lot when you talk about it. So the city is contributing, and that's through CRA money, that's through city uh, infrastructure, uh, the word I'm looking for, impact fees, all different ways that things are going on, and um, so far there's been several that have already, already built, and some are actually construction is going to start um, hopefully within a week or so. One is under construction right now on 14th Street. Then, so, you know, the city has contributed quite a bit, um, and, but we can, we can contribute more. So, you know, and it's important as we get these out, and I, you know, worked with all the staff, our CRA staff, our planning staff, the, the whole city staff to get this information. And it's important, and that's something that, you know, I, I was gonna say it a little earlier, but, um, or later, but, you know, I want it to be out there now too. 
we're trying and I appreciate this council and when I was a council member was part of it and to continue to grow things so um, I appreciate that um, and then on that part of it I think that's everything I had on that mr. Sanders uh, on that one subject matter for mrs. Copeland <clears throat> I think what she's referring to is that we had about 10.67 million of ARPA money from the federal government and affordable housing is one of the uh, available uh, forms that we can sp spend that on and Sarasota County I don't know if they've approved it but they mentioned that they would put 25 million in out of their 80 million and Manatee County has uh, designated I think 15 million out of their 78 million and I asked last meeting for fifth, about the same percentage 15 percent or a million and a half and it didn't go anywhere so that's I think that's what she's referring to is that we didn't dedicate any money to the ARPA and so uh, out of ARPA to the affordable housing fund and then the year before I asked for 500,000 and that was returned or turned down so uh, yes I don't think we're doing enough uh, we're not getting uh, enough funds to, to do these things with and um, City of Braden has done a good job better than most other governments in affordable housing uh, I said so I think we're in the leader of the pack but most of that I'd say 90% of that is coming out of our CRA which is redevelopment itself it is um, you know it's not necessarily city funds uh, waiving impact fees sometimes is is good if it's truly affordable but if it's um, and, and we have a language problem with um, the words affordable attainable workforce housing it's used somewhere in the perspective of you know wide range and I don't necessarily agree with that but the city of Braden can can determine what affordable is based on citizens comments and council's comments we, we can set a, a, a standard here that says what's affordable in our community we don't have to use HUD or anybody else so I would suggest that we would look at that that would be part of our comprehensive plan that I've been pushing for to ha have what do we want in our city do we want to sell City Hall do we want to have major development there do we want to have luxury apartments do we want to have affordable housing do we want to uh, where, where's our streets do we have street closures etc so it, it's a bigger issue than just one little thing but we have an opportunity to take this million and a half dollars right today uh, I would, I would suggest that we look at that and re-vote on that. Thank you. Um, any other comments on this part? Thank you, Ms. Copeland. And, and definitely, I appreciate you keeping this in the forefront. And, and, you know, the city is contributing and, you know, different ways to do it. So we appreciate that part of it. Mr. Uh, Mayor, if yes. I could, before you get off of the, the responses, could I have an opportunity? Yes. So I just wanted, since, since our firm was, was raised uh, in public comment, I just wanted to make sure the council is aware, and I think you are, we don't represent clients in deals with the city, and we don't represent the city in deals with our clients. Um, the particular um, issue that has been raised, we haven't had any involvement in. The administrator has hired outside council to advise the city on that. I just want to make sure that was clear. Uh, comment on that please hold on are you finished mr Russo? yes okay thank you mr Sanders. uh we did we hired outside conflict council in 2019 the, the boss law firm and you directed me to call them yesterday and i did and she was surprised that that they hadn't got a call from you to uh because you're in the lead when it conflict comes up not not a council person it's not my duty to do that and so she was very surprised she couldn't be here this morning or she would be and uh, I suggest that maybe we look at uh, hiring a conflict uh, firm that's local that can get here on a, a calls notice and uh, revisit that and uh, that's a council is going to have to vote on that so I, I'd like to put that on the table that we do that because we were many times uh, we should have had I don't feel comfortable um, with not having representation you know when I go to court I want the lawyer beside me to be on my side uh, I, d I don't want to have this feeling that I can't get a, 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 
an opinion that would benefits me and I'm talking about me as a council person on this board so I would like to revisit with the council to um, uh, get uh, council locally and Mr. Perry I know you're shaking your head I'll say the same thing you said to me a couple weeks ago you hired an outside firm to look at this and it wasn't brought before council they were out of, I don't know, St. Petersburg or someplace. I think they were friends of yours or you'd said that you knew them, right? So I don't think that's a good conflict attorney. Mayor, if I can just address that. Yes, sir. I wouldn't know if I bumped into him in the hallway. I've never met the lawyer before. I have no pecuniary interest. And I think your allegation that I knew him is a little bit overreaching. I don't know what we're talking about as far as a conflict. I don't know if it's a conflict for the inspection of public records that you do and don't do, or if it's related to a land deal or whatnot, but it's becoming a problem. Yes. And I, I think that I will work through the council's attorney and where appropriate, recommend that you have independent count, you know, counsel. Right. There's a conflict situation. I don't know when we're talking about conflict, if we're talking about the conflict for the attorney that I, retained to review the um, appropriate manner for consideration of disposition of City Hall. Yes. Um, I can tell you that in speaking with Mr. Rudisell and his firm, we both felt that there could be a potential conflict and that under the rules of professional responsibility, w the best way to handle that was to get outside counsel. I understand that, and that was at my request. Right. No, no, it wasn't at your request. Yeah, yes, it was. But anyway, that, was that, uh, that was not. Well, how do you know? Mr. S uh, Mr. Sanders, listen, what he's talking let me finish. What he's talking about is something different, I think, than you're talking about. What Mr. Rudisell brought up is something different. So okay. I think there's I don't a know different, that, yeah, there's a different angle. I don't know that angle. you've seen my emails either, but um, I, the, um, uh, we have a contract with this boss law firm that says that they are to be uh, uh, first notified, not why are we going around that process? Okay, I'm gonna explain it again. I explained it before. There's three reasons why we use conflict counsel. Now, counsel that's conflict doesn't have expertise. The disposition of City Hall involves a mer myriad of different state statutes that deal with unsolicited offers under Section 266, under 155 CRA, because it's within the CRA, and the like. This particular law firm has experience from the North Miami area about doing CRA projects. They represent three CRAs. I don't think our conflict council has any experience in doing that. So that, that's one of the reasons. The other way, way a conflict arises is when we have uh, mutual interest of parties that can be disaligned, and so we have to get them each a separate attorney. And the third way is when we don't, when there's excess of legal work and we don't have the capacity to take on another project through our, through our uh, a contract law firm. So usually one of those three ways would be the way I would look at is it appropriate to assign an outside lawyer for conflict but, but purposes. That wasn't brought Th this the is counsel. a no-brainer in my opinion. You're yeah. looking for a specialty lawyer with expertise. No, no, you, I know. Right, right. But, but with the, the law firm we have, uh, the <coughs> lady's been a law firm in the, in the law uh, uh, for cities and counties for 48 years. So and I, she represents uh, Anne Marie Island and she says she will never represent two government entities at the same time because that does become conflicting. So I think she is expert, uh, but e either way, we, we, went, we went around that process that the council had already voted on, and I have a problem with that. I'm sorry. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, yes, sir, Mr. Roth. Yeah, um, I guess I, I, it sounds like there's a couple different conversations going on. Um, but the one that I hear is um, our standby conflict counsel votes mm -hmm. that, that, okay, so I was on board when Bill Lish retired and we went with uh, uh, the current attorney. Um, and I didn't, uh, I, I don't think it was explained that there could be conflicts at that time and we need a conflict attorney. So this is something that came up later. Having gone through the charter uh, situation, um, I got to say, I don't have confidence in our conflict council from Winter Haven. I mean, I, I wouldn't have a problem with us entertaining having a secondary council here that is in Bradenton for when there is a conflict. I, I, I don't know what 
what that takes or how that gets. I don't want to make a motion or vote on that or anything, but I, I, I would not be opposed to uh, having a second, a conflict council locally, so that when we have conflicts, they're here. I think that's a decent point. Thank you. I, absolutely, and I'd like to, to to do that. If we want a motion, I'll be glad to make it if I can get a second. But, but what? You're not going to continue. Do uh, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable not being to have legal counsel to, to guide me in some of these situations. So, um, I, it, it, I, I don't think it's just, you know, just me. I think it should be mandatory that we have that if we know that there's a conflict we're having with any issue that we have, a, a, you know, a lawyer to be able to give us an opinion and guide us. And I'm not getting that. Uh, so my, one of my questions, thinking just hearing this now, I think what <clears throat> Mr. Perry's talking about is one thing, what Mr. Rudetel is talking about is another thing, and what you're talking about is a third thing. So yeah, because again, it's three different things, and I think that's, and again, I have always been in my tenure on this council, and now as mayor, for workshops. Mm -hmm. There was others that weren't for workshops but now are for workshops. So I believe we're gonna start having a lot of workshops because some of this stuff that we're talking about is you know, confusing when you're talking about different things. So I think at this point, and, I, and I'll say it now, Mr. Perry, if it's all right, we're planning a workshop for next week, next Wednesday. So you know, we always try to work within everybody's schedule and we unfortunately had, because of a health issue, had to cancel the workshop and we didn't have to cancel it <coughs> we decided because we want everybody here right. to cancel it so that was asked by mr right. roth right. which isn't a secret right. and it's you know we could have still had it without you but right. it, and one time years ago i couldn't be at one and you guys did that for me mm -hmm. because it was important that we all try to work together as a team here well, so I'm that's not sure i can be at that one that's the first i've heard of well it. that's what we were going to mention it to okay. you know well, that we're going to so schedule you know, a workshop communication is yeah. Important. Well, we talked. Mr. Perry and I talked about this at 4:30 yesterday. Do we wait till the first week of May, or do we try next week? And that's why we're going to bring it up today. So, um, um, so anyway, um, moving forward from that, and thank you, Mr. Jones, for staying because most times that when you come in, you do leave right away. And um, well, one of our comments, and one of our our policy is, and this is going to be talked about at a workshop. I'm very excited. Code of conduct for elected officials and something that's been approved. The previous mayor and, um, and I, when I came in, tried to allow comments at different times and different ways things to be done, but with some situations going on, we went back to the policy. We stuck to the policy, and part of that policy is public meetings, hearing protocols, is council members shall withhold comment during the public hearing portion of the meeting right, till the conclusion. Right. Please, sir, I'm, I'm talking. There's not. I need a meeting with you. I know what public comment is. Sir, I'm sir, you're out of order. And I'm out of here. So the, the facts and the truth and the code of conduct matter. We are going to continue to do that. I have left, I have left a. I'm talking about public comment. I'm talking about meeting with you. Mr. You have to wait around No, you're not. If you, if you. Thank you, Mr. We're going to be in order here, and I'm going to continue. I'm going to say what I'm going to say with that, but the public's presentations, and, you know, we're not going to argue with people. We're not going to debate during the wrong time, but my point is I have with Mr. Jones, he had emailed me. Every time he's emailed me, he's got his information that he's asking the email. Also, he, have, he had called me, left me a message. I called him back, left him a message to call me. Since that day, he has not requested another meeting. I called him back and am waiting for him to return the call or the next conversation. The chief of police, the NAACP new president, and I had a meeting over at the PAL a couple weeks ago about some situations that are going on in Ward 4. Mrs. Coachman was involved in that. Um, I'm sorry, Ward 5, yep. Um, <laughs> right there. Now it was in Ward 5. Mrs. Coachman was involved in that part of it. So we are having meetings. I've met with other members that have called of all communities. There is no black or white community in Brayden. There's our community, and we're going to continue to meet.
but we are not going to be hijacked and we are not going to go down a road that is not the right road for us to be in a positive way to do it. So the reason I asked Mr. Jones to stay so we could hear that part of it. I am willing to meet, but you've got to also be willing to meet in a, in a uh, manner that we're going to do it in a calm and professional way. So thank you. All right, moving on, Mrs. Melton. We are requesting approval of the consent agenda, items A through G. <coughs> All right, do here. Chair will entertain a motion. I'd like to pull a couple items. Okay, Mr. Sanders, you have a motion and then pull. Uh, pull item A and B. A and B. So we have a motion by Mr. Sanders to approve the consent agenda, pulling A and B. Is there a second? Second. All right, we've got a motion and a second. All right, any further discussion? Hearing none, let's <coughs> take a vote in Ward 2. Yes. Three. Yep. Four. Yes. Five. Yes. And one. Yes. Okay, Mr. Sanders, carries uh, unanimously. And okay, thank you. Um, item A, administrative services. This is um, good. <laughs> I've been asking this for a long time. And I, you know, four years, so that's a long time to me. Um, so I, I, and I, I appreciate it. And there's only one person that responded is the uh, purchasing uh, manager in the room that, yes. I believe so. I, I'd like Mayor, to Councilor, yes. I believe she, uh, Ms. Tammy Spielman is, is here. Yes, if, if she could speak that, that just, just to the process of why it was, it was uh, why you think only one person did this, did we put, did we, uh, put it out to enough people? It, it, it'd be surprising only one uh, that's the only question I have. Is it surprising only one uh, responded to this study? I know there's a lot of market studies out there that's available. So is, do you have any concept of why there was only one response? Yes, sir. Good morning. Um, we post our solicitations on a national database <coughs> and we advertise in the local newspaper. For this one, um, we had 10 plan holders, which means it was 10 people who downloaded the solicitation. We sent it out to 121. 24 of those were companies that I got from Mrs. Taylor, and I added it to the list. So um, we had 10 people originally respond, I mean, interested in it, but they didn't respond. I, 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 I don't, I've done due diligence, and people have schedules, they were busy. <laughs> You know, so I don't have a reason as to why more didn't respond. Yeah, I know. Uh, what, what, what was the, uh, is this, uh, what's the cost of this study? It's, um, it's 31. 31 thousand. Th and we can negotiate because it is around. Well, I, st I see that we don't have a contract yet. No, we and don't. So we're still negotiating. So we haven't we, aren't we, you know, I know what you're wanting here in the consent uh, approval is to move forward, yes. which I don't have a problem with that, but I, I don't want this to be taken as this is a final vote because we should have the contract reviewed by Mr. Rizzell before we actually vote to accept this. So it will come back to us. Yes. Um, but the, the figure is 31,000 and we didn't give the backup, but I did look at the backup and, and some of it's in there only one, it was 80 pages. So I didn't have time to read it be honest with you, but I read far enough that I could, it stopped me. <coughs> and I read far enough to say that the city of Braden is hiring a project manager for this. We're not hiring a project manager between Ms. Taylor and... Um, We're going to uh, point one then. Point, point an existing employee to be the project manager correct, for this. Correct. It says to be determined, so I didn't know. If, correct. We're not going to hire anyone. We're going to use no, exist. It'd be like Ms. Taylor or someone else, not, someone not a new shop. hire uh, uh, employee. No, sir. No, okay. sir. Not a new hire. Okay. That, that so uh, I would uh, go ahead and accept this as just an approval to move forward on the contract and bring this back as a uh, c contract that's been uh, vetted by our city attorney at a later date. Correct. Correct. Uh, that, that's my motion. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? To approve A. On the agenda, so Mayor. Yes, if, if Mr. Rudisell could just maybe opine a little bit on whether it's a two-step process or what, whether after the recommendation of award we can uh, go do best and final and, and nego negotiate the final terms of the contract. I'd like to just hear that 
Yeah, typically it is a two-step process. The, the, there's an award of the, the winning bidder, and then there's a negotiation of a contract that comes back to the council. Okay. Right. Otherwise, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know what we're voting on. Right. All right. Thank and, you. And that is what the agenda memo indicates. Right. Yep. Can you I just wanted to make discussion? sure. All right. Hearing none, start the vote in Ward 3. Yep. Yeah. Four. Yes. Five. Yes. One. Yes. Two. Yes. Approved five to zero. Thank you. All right. Item B is the uh, minutes from December 2nd, which is one, two, three, four, almost five months ago. In the minutes, uh, this was a workshop on December 2nd. Uh, there was a presentation by Kimberly Horn about the Riverwalk extensions 2A, 2B, 2C. And uh, he said everything was ready to go, 60% plans was there. And we had, obviously we brought, brought him in because we had some very uh, serious concerns that this project has been delayed and moving slower than what it should have been. So we called him uh, in to the carpet to, to discuss that. Uh, and he discussed what the r r delays was, but it still never had any meat on its bone from the second uh, portions of the river walk. And uh, it says, I'll just read some of the minutes here just because I can go further. Uh, council members and the mayor strongly advise Mr. Pinkerin to continue working as expeditiously as possible and not to wait for completion of project uh, first project or the first phase one before starting another uh, mayor brown then asked for an immediate bi-weekly uh, uh report on the progress mr perry recommended that public works staff and kimberly horn meet bi-weekly mayor brown requested an update on the progress at city council meeting december 15th and uh, Mr. Pankernan, is that how you pronounce his name? I don't want to, I don't want to, Mr. P, uh, agreed to come before council to provide regular updates. Well, he has not been here since December 2nd. If it is, I missed that meeting. And uh, we have, um, we, we haven't started the phase two, for, and that's been whatever, this December, January, February, March, out in the fifth month. And I know we approved last meeting for the um, uh, contracts to uh, money to be approved for phase two a and b and, and i see mr um, uh, allen is here today and i went back and played the tape and it was promised that we would start the next day i mean i mean literally the next day that wasn't a acronym for uh three weeks that's been three weeks ago and I'm, I'd like to have, uh, I'd like to know why we aren't started. I know I've talked to you, Mr. Uh, 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 Jim, uh, but that's not good enough for me. Uh, you know, because here's what, here's what I know that concerns me. I was contacted by <clears throat> a previous city administrator about one, one or both of those sections and the river walk being purchased for development of apartments and there was the the quest request or ask to me was if we'd vacate some streets i said well you'd kill a river walk i mean that would absolutely just kill it he said well we'll give you back a sidewalk i said well, wait a minute give us back you, you pretend you, that, that sounds like it's you know past tense it's like how are you going to give us back? First of all, we haven't agreed to give it to you in the first place. So anyway, this conversation goes on uh, later, and, and now we have uh, before us this afternoon, or sometime this morning, a uh, dock permit that we can talk about this. But anyway, I'm really concerned if this project is going to be fully what we expected and have told the public. So I'd like to have some conversation. Mr. Allen can step up and tell us. And uh, but I, I'm getting different uh, answers when I talk to different people. Jim, did you have any comment that you'd need to make on the December second meeting? And today, well, I'm just saying for that first part. Um, well, I'm I'm happy to coordinate with Mr. Pankin and to have him come on a regular basis to give you an update. But at this point, the design for 2B and 2C is 
essentially completed, and they are in the process of starting the design on the last phase. Um, as I indicated to you this morning, the, the contractor indicated to me that they will be out there today starting the demolition, the tree removal along the Riverside Drive, as well as getting prepped to start taking down the knee wall that's on top of the seawall. So that process is, is moving forward. Do you have any knowledge of, of, of the ask from the city for a vacation of those streets? I have, I've heard, I've had the same conversation you had with, with Mr. Callahan. Um, but that would be up to the council if they were ever to so well, I, I know present that, that, that before hasn't you. Came before us, so, uh, but all those properties have been purchased. There's like I looked it up. There's like 13 properties that were purchased by this uh, investment <coughs> group, and so you don't buy 13 properties up right along the river unless you have a full intentions of building something, and because they're paying some good prices, some of them is well over a million dollars. And uh, they're all right in front of this, our project. So I, I think we need to have a discussion and, and sincere commitment to either the project or kill the project. And I'm not for killing it, but I'm, I'm for let's, let's, let's get it done. Let's, let's don't have any of this <coughs> stuff that I'm hearing. It, it, it very, I am very, I'm heartbroken because we've been telling people for years that we're going to connect the river walk that we existingly have and you can walk on down go to the park and you know, you know enjoy the river walk and now i feel like it they've been lied to and i i have and i don't i'm i'm upset and and i'm i'm, I'm disappointed well at at the last council meeting you approved the the guaranteed maximum prices for the next two phases with no the modifications phase. To, uh, uh, that's your words. No. No. That's no, I listened to the tape as well. Did you? Yeah, I did. And he said he would want to start as soon as possible. And as I indicated to you this morning, starting as soon as possible means starting to secure subcontractors. That, is, that has been done. They are in the process of doing all of that, which is why they are now starting construction on those next two phases. The, the design that was approved and the guaranteed maximum price associated with it is building it as was the original intent with no modifications associated with anybody vacating a roadway. None of that. Well, this is not our first conversation about when it would start. I just read it to you five months ago. So that was the design work associated with those phases. You didn't. We would do not wait for one section to start another section. And that has now been said multiple times by multiple people that we do not have to finish this section before we start that section. Understood. And, neither, and, and it's, not, it's not happening. Well, as of today, if they're oh, out yeah, dropping the trees. I, I understand because I, 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 I telegraphed you that. I'm going to be d doing this, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, not happy that I have to answer questions of what's going on in my community. That is my ward. I understand that. And it doesn't look good when, when a, you know, all the property gets built up or bought up. Well, and, I don't have any control me to, over who to, buys property. I'm sorry. I know. I don't have anything to do with that right. either. But you, you. really, that's not my business. Uh, but my business is you know, councilman to, to make sure this river walk that we promised and have earmarked $7 million gets finished. But I, I hope you're not trying to imply that there's some backroom deal going on that says we're going to not do the project because somebody wants to do a development. That is not the case. That. Those are your words. Now you're putting words. Uh, yes, understood. So, so, uh, no, I'm not I can do it that. too. It just, it, 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 you know, if it walk, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, must be a duck, right? Mm -hmm. That's That's all I can say. So anyway, uh, the council has the final say on what I thought we does or does not say. get built. Sorry. Right. Uh, well, the final say was a long time ago. And, and <coughs> it's still not being done, so. Thank you, Jim. And I, I just want I have not heard, I've heard the properties are being bought up, but I haven't heard anything about vacations or, 
our properties and all that. So, Mr. Callanan said Mr. that you Mr. and Mr. Perry. Uh, sir, please it, have a seat for one second, if you don't mind. But I'm going to ask Mr. Allen to come up first. He was he's the contractor on it to say about timing of things. Good morning. Good morning. For the record, my name is Ron Allen, a DC Construction Company Mayor, Council, um, Councilman Sanders. Um, if you don't mind, I, it's going to take me a few minutes to get through all the discussion that you just had related to this. I'll start off with phase 2B and C. I did say we were ready to start immediately, but you have to understand with any city project, I cannot do anything until I have approval for a contract from you, which occurred approximately two weeks ago. In that two week period, I have to do a number of things. One is I've got to add that project to my insurance. I've got to get payment and performance bonds uh, perfected and get those get those issued before I can go out there. I've got to make sure that we have, with every city project that we do, and any city project that's done, you have to have a pre-construction meeting with Public Works. That's a requirement. So for you to make the assumption that we were going to be on site the next day working, I think was a little bit of a stretch uh, for today um, because I do have a, a fiduciary and an obligation to the city to provide the service that I'm being contracted for and that's to keep the public safe and that's to keep the city safe from what we're doing. So I'm a little bit concerned as to why um, you would bring that up. We are, we are actually starting today. Uh, it is pure coincidence. Um, and again, you can look at me and you can shirk, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but we're in our normal process that we are. I am not responsible for phase one, um, the timing of phase one of permitting. There was permitting that was required. I don't control that process, uh, neither does the city. We're, we're tied to other agencies in that case. Fortunately, 2B and 2C don't have those kind of ties to them. The only thing we have a requirement for is Swift Mud, which we have the permit for, and getting the permits through the city of Bradenton's public works, which, again, they've been working diligently on this process also. So I, I think it was, is wrong for you to portray to the public that in some way, shape, or form that this project isn't moving forward under its normal circumstances. Um, the second part of this, um, and I'm not sure who you were... Um, describing um, this is a small community there is a, a, a group that is purchasing land in that area I will tell you unequivocally I do not have any involvement in that none nobody that I'm aware of on either Kimley Horn or uh, NDC staff is involved in so I don't know what I can tell you about your discussion of a vacation of streets and I have not heard a thing about it so I can't tell you that I know anything about it, because I haven't. Um, I'm just moving forward with the pro project as we contracted. So I appreciate so, your comments. Uh, Mr. Allen, I've got one question for you. Would any of that, if there was any properties purchased, which we know so many have, I don't know the numbers, I had heard that it was happening, but would any of that affect where the Riverwalk is designed to go right now? No, our contract is very specific as originally designed and that's what we're basing our, our movements on and our construction process on. And, and since four years ago or so, when some of this was, I think it was about four years ago when this was designed to go to Manatee Avenue, there was talk and especially Mr. Sanders at one point wanted to try, as we all did, to get maybe a cut through on some houses to where we could make a street either one way to go so people would not have to get onto Manatee Avenue, but that didn't affect the overall project of anything you're doing now. If we got it, it would be moved. If we didn't get it, it stays on Manatee Avenue, or it could do both. Right, and, and that, was, that was what I always, <coughs> as a council, I say that a lot, as a councilman, that's what I was hoping, that we could find other ways and other angles, but we designed it to be where, no matter what happened, if we didn't buy anything or get anything else, Riverwalk could still connect at some way all the way to Manatee Avenue and back. Absolutely, and that's why we, um, in our meetings, we reprioritize the phases 
so that it would allow that phase to be the last phase to be designed and constructed, which would give the city the flexibility or the time to go see if there is an alternate because frankly, going up to Manti Avenue and back down is not really the most conducive um, for a river walk. So we were always helpful or hopeful that, that the city would come up with a solution that would allow us to either connect it through Tarpon Point, if Tarpon Point development happened at that point, or some other mechanism a little further south, but not having to go all the way to Manti Avenue. And, and speaking to that, and I did, you just made me think of it right now when you said Tarpon Point, if at some point we develop this whole river walk built out, and later on there is some developments, we can always then reconnect in a way that might get closer to the river. Oh, oh absolutely. Benefit yeah, I mean, absolutely, and, and I will share with you, you know, if you look at the at the design potential for that last phase, if it goes all the way up to Manti Avenue, you're really only talking about sidewalk improvements and, and directional kind of things, which are not overly expensive, that if you were fortunate enough to come up with that better solution, that you would probably say, let's do it and not, not have to affect much. And having both, to me, as a citizen, because my wife and I walk down there, and sometimes we walk to that place on the corner of Manatee Avenue that's got good donuts, you know, which is maybe the good thing to walk and to go buy the donuts, but you'd want to go to Manatee Avenue. A absolutely. Or you'd want to cut over. So Yeah, you would never remove it, obviously, but it would be a nice enhancement. It gives a lot of options, and that's what I right. appreciate we've talked about. So, uh, Mr. Sanders? Uh, uh, sorry if you thought I meant you were the developer of, of new uh, apartments. I don't know who that is, but Mr. Callahan uh, does and he is a consultant at your company now, right? Uh, no. no, he is a consultant. He said it, he was. I he's a know. consultant in the community and actually does some work with us. But in that instance, for that, that may be for another developer that doesn't include us. Uh, yeah, I, he did say he uh, represented uh, a couple other developers trying to mm -hmm. put together a package of Tarpon Point all the way down to to where your development. Uh, uh, a absolutely, is, which is was. a natural because right. it's waterfront. Right, absolutely. I, mean, uh, I, I, I understand that. But what I'm saying is is that's that's he's the one that's telling me this, and he's wanting to vacate um, um, Riverside Drive and 10th Street Court and 10th Street period up to the uh, park, Glacier Gates Park, which actually would give them more room to go both directions and toward the river walk, river walk, and they, they would give us a sidewalk there, and we'd be calling that a river walk, which that's not a sidewalk. So that's what he said that was proposed, it hasn't come before us, but that, that's what makes me nervous and concerned. The other thing you said about there's not much to be done uh, right by the Manatee Hospital, we're moving that whole street in about 10 feet and taking and making more room along the waterway and taking uh, the city-owned right-of-way, so that, that's, that's not, that's pretty good. That's a pretty sizable project. It's sizable, and if I use that terminology, um, and and you took it on the constructability side, that's not what I meant. What I meant was I don't have the enhanced permitting through either FDOT or Swift Mud or or um, Army Corps that we've had to deal with in Phase One. That's my, that was my point. It's a very straightforward. We're we're working basically under a city. Um, SIP permit uh, from Public Works, and and other than that, we really don't need anything else from a uh, an, an agency approval standpoint. That was what I was explaining in that process. We're just basically moving the road and creating that what you just described, absolutely, and that's why we we purposefully try to stay out of the. Um, the, the river area in that in that section so that we weren't in that different agency uh, approval process, which again, as you saw in phase one, just elongates the time to get those approvals. But we don't have any approval process with those phase two, uh, two the other two phases. And uh, the we, only permitting that was needed was already been done by the city, so that was done some time ago. Well, we had city and then we had Swift Mud also. I don't want to well, exclude. Swift Mud also approved this. Pardon me? Mr. McClellan says Swift Mud's already approved. Uh, absolutely. That's what I'm saying. So there's, there's no hold up with We permits. did have two agencies, city and right. uh, Swift Mud. <laughs> and and, and at the meeting, as you was at three weeks ago, not two weeks ago, they, they, I, I said there's nothing else that I'm going to hear between now 
and tomorrow or the next day or whatever uh, that, that's going to hold this project up, like electrical feeds and that type yeah. of stuff. And he, he said, no, the same day he got that. He, so he, he's, uh, it's, it's been three weeks, and, and it, it should have well, already been started. Okay, again, um, I, I don't know how else to explain it more than I did before is um, we do this on a regular basis. And for you to think that from the time you say yes to a contract for me to have people on site, I just shared with you my responsibilities to make sure that the city is getting what they're paying for in a construction manager. So if that three week period or two week period, whatever you want to argue about uh, from that standpoint, um, I, I really can't say much other than I'm going to continue to do the systems the way we do them to protect our owners and I'll do that tomorrow. Thank you. Mr. Roth? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I didn't know this was coming up, but since it did, and uh, we're talking about Kimberly Horn, can I ask you, because um, I do remember this meeting now, it was a while ago, uh, and uh, I, I'd say that the representative was kind of taken to the woodshed that day. Are, do you feel that they're, are you waiting on Kimberly Horn at all, or are they, are they, are well, they? As I described in the meeting that we had three weeks ago, and I'll use your three weeks just for, um, uh, I'll, I'll, admit, I'll commit to that just so it's they, they weren't, for they discussion. Were you were here, they weren't. That's correct. And yeah. when we had the discussion, we did talk, both uh, Mr. McClellan and myself talked about the electrical drawings falling behind of the rest of the drawings. And, and so that was not a surprise to anybody. And I don't think it was a surprise to you because we shared that with you. Um, they are working um, as just like um, it's easy for a construction manager to blame a design professional for timing um, because everybody's busy. Um, and so I would be on The conversation that day was, we don't want to hear we're busy, to them, we don't want to hear you're busy because we give you this a long time ago and you better get unbusy when it comes to us. And, so, and I, so my question is, are you waiting on them? And, and uh, as I said uh, in, the, in the, the previous meeting, we are waiting for some electrical drawings for the electrical layouts, but that's not impeding us from starting the process. It will at some point, obviously, impede us being able to go forward, um, but I'd rather you have that direct conversation with them as opposed to us saying yay or nay, uh, are, are, they, are they responsive or non-responsive? Uh, we have drawings available to us that we are out um, contracting and, uh, getting, and getting the work started. So we are in both those phases um, other than the electrical at this point. Well, can you pass a message to them that I, I now remember this meeting and I remember him, I remember being point blank to him that I wasn't happy and... Uh, well, I think I'm, we do have a... Uh, a, do we have a team meeting coming up? Is it? Yeah, okay. so uh, Monday, the next yeah. one will be Monday. We'd be more than happy to bring that up with as much enthusiasm as right. you would like us to. But sure. if you remember, we're contracted to you I, I, and I, they're no, contracted no. I, to I, you. I'm just asking you since you were here. I, I, yeah, like, no, and I, and I, I appreciate that. I didn't know this was coming up. Yeah, so, so and again, I, I, you know, uh, I know Councilman Sanders, you're on, this, on site quite a bit with us. And, uh, and we love having you on site. Um, if, um, if there's ever an issue, and I guess the other, my final point is, um, we've been doing lots of projects for the city over the years. Um, I wish you would take the opportunity to pick up the phone and call me if you have a concern to talk about, as opposed to us doing it in this formal setting. If you have any questions or concerns, I would love to sit and chat with you anytime. Um, and, and I would make myself available uh, for that um, on any project. So uh, one, one final comment, Mr. McClellan said that all electrical plans that he's aware of or that's available, you have. I, ha I have the available plans that, but they're still working on connections, um, which is, which is uh, what happens is you have two steps in an electrical process. You have the location of those fixtures and, and all the electrical requirements on the site, and then you have the circuitry associated with that to go back. And that's a, usually a combination of 
of both um, Kimberly Horn in this case and FPNL in getting that circuitry done and we're still waiting for that final circuitry. So what I'm saying is we are, have the ability to get started out there uh, but we do not have uh, to, uh, the sufficient drawings for all the connections that are necessary for the lights to come on but that'll come as the process continues. But you have all the locates because Jim said he walked it uh, and showed you where all the, the locates were so you can start that's not preventing any starting thing and and I didn't say that in my comment we are started today okay mr. Sanders you have a motion thank you through B the minutes um, <laughs> yes I, I motion to approve B Jack we have a motion and a second to approve B is there any further discussion hearing none we'll start the vote in Ward 4 yes 5 Yes. One? Yes. Two? Yes. <coughs> Three? Yep. Approved five to zero. Um, the, Mr. Sanders, you had brought up something about properties and a gentleman stepped up. So, sir, if you could just have, be brief on that to tell us. Uh, yes. My name is James Shubanks. I live at 902 Riverside Drive East. I'm the managing member of MRW Associates, the company that has purchased all these properties. Um, my history has been. Uh, pretty substantial in this neighborhood. 16 years ago, I did the assemblage on 45 different property owners of 125 parcels there. And that was Riviera South Shores, and then the market went belly up, and now a new development is there. Uh, last year, we came in and started to purchase properties. We own all the waterfront, except the uh, one on 9th Street and Riverside, which is a new home, and the one in question for the first resolution for a dock here. Uh, I think you might be a little confused regarding the vacation of streets, um, one that's very premature of where we're at in our development aspect of things. I know at the meetings that we have had with the city that we are very interested in wanting to work with the city to help complete that river walk. We think it's an excellent uh, thing to do. Um, having a mixed use type use to really tie in downtown to this end to that end to be one continuous thing i think you might have been uh discussing more the vacation around third avenue east um because that street is so small i know previous drawings from the city was bringing the <coughs> walk down third avenue and the, then down so um regarding vacation of streets that would only be relevant if we own 100 percent of everything around those streets um wouldn't be any point of trying to request anything of that nature right. unless it had a benefit to all parties concerned because it's a public thoroughfare and if it can benefit the public that it does get shut off and you know done then that's that's in everybody's best interest but that's way premature all I wanted you to know is that as a company our objective is to work with the city to really help make the river walk flourish and to fit into that for the whole realm of what the city's long-term plans are and that's pretty much Okay. Uh, what I wanted you to not be so. Uh, I appreciate out that. From all I'm, I'm glad to. I'm glad that you came. Came. I wish I'd spoke to you much earlier so yeah, I understood. You, yeah, my my phone's right. I understand. My phone's been ringing off the hook. And let Let me tell you some of the, and 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 I was uh, approached about the vacation vacate of that Riverside and the two Tenth Street sections along the side to the back, because. I think you've bought every property in that section except one. Is that yes. true? Okay. That's correct. And so um, th th there is obviously a plan for that. I, 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 you know, it will come out. And uh, there is not enough room from Glacier Gates Park to the property lines of those properties that you've purchased without going and taking up some city uh, street to get it to, to, to put apartments or whatever it is oh, that's yeah, going to be put in. There we is? We own all of that except the corner. We own that whole block there except the corner. Yeah, but it's not very deep. Yeah, those are those lots are not very deep. Well, that's what the architecture for. Okay. All right. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, I mean. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I went back and looked at the, uh, I take meticulous notes. And on the, uh, February 10th, uh, Mr. Kelly and I talked about this for 21 minutes at 534. PM. Mm -hmm. uh, two weeks later at Tiger Bay, he was supposed to have come to me and give me some drawings of that. He didn't. He said he had already presented it to uh, Mr. Perry and, and um, the mayor. So 
I, you know. Yeah, but the, all of that is preliminary until we're finalizing what we're, you know, what our objective is, and then we sit down and we decide what's going to be in the best interest of us in reference to what will the city want us to do at the same time because we're not going to get an approval. I mean, we, you know, uh, Mr. Barnaby uh, remembers uh, those torturous uh, meetings that we'd have when the developer tries to get much more than the city's willing to do. It just is a nightmare, um, you know, and that's, you know, even though I had recommended that what we got approved for is what I recommended originally because that's kind of how you, you got to be able to work with what you're realm is in so right um i just wanted you to not freak out so much that, i'm not freaking out you know we're we're wanting I, I, to i'm 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 sad i'm the concerned is, is to yes. really help that river walk uh the best way we can i don't freak out i don't have any skin in this game uh, uh, uh you know, seriously i i i live well, in that and i make skin because you represent the area i do yeah so that's and the skin and that and, have, and right? there's and there's a lot of buzz out there let me tell you, a guy, you know, you talk about the Third Street cut through, that has nothing to do with the river walk. It's something that we've wanted. So a guy called me uh, a couple weeks ago and said, uh, what's the city doing taking up my property? I said, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. And so I went and visited him, and he says, well, this developer is, uh, that's purchasing land is telling, told my neighbor that they was going to put apartments in here and uh, bring Afghan refugees to live in them, the low, low rent. I said, <laughs> I said, well, did you believe that? And he says, well, no, but they, they bought the property for a million, too. I said, hey, that's between them and, and, and them. Good for him. He, he, made, he made some money, I guarantee you. And then they come back and he says, I'm the, probably the only one that's holding out, and they want to give me five, 600000 And now they're telling me that if I don't, they'll build apartments anyway. And that my well, land, my, my land will fly. right to do whatever right. they That's want. right. He does. He does. He does. But here's and where this it This is an enterprise zone yep. that has been there for 25 years. I understand. I understand. But he, he was Great blaming the city. Place. And I said, look, we don't have nothing to do with that. That's yeah. private private company to private owner. Yeah. You can do what you want. You can sell it. Don't do sell it. I, I, do with our what, what's, your, what's your position with the city? He said, well, here's now the new threat, that the city's going to come and take my property anyway for the Third Street cut through. I said, not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge, and we do own probably part of your front yard because we have surveyed it, and it does go over there. So I've, because I've seen the survey markers, and so have you. So yes, that is a possibility. I mean, and, and it's a very thin street. So I mean, it's it's just a little, almost like an alley cut through there. Is right. It, it's on. it's so it's wider than what. But it that's appears. something that you know. But I've seen um, drawings that you know the city had put out that they were going to cut through on six and come down third and come down ninth. The river. So you know. Um, uh, like you said, you know, complete things, you know, you know where you're going to be at. And then hopefully as a group, you know, of all the landowners there and things, we can get something figured out to, to make it where it's best for the city and everybody involved. That's what our objective is. So I just wanted you to feel a little more comfortable with we're not trying to. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I don't have any, uh, any, any beef with you because, of the, uh, you know, landowners are, I mean, matter of fact, after a call the other day, I got a call and asked me to sell my house because I'm not very far from there. I'm right on the water. And uh, I said, no, I'm not interested in selling right now, but I'll keep your number in case I do because, sure. yeah, I, know what, I don't know what the market is now. Yeah. You know, so you have set the standard for the market. But, but, but my, but my uh, I've done a lot of research on this, so you know that, you know, we, we vacated a numerous amount of streets in there uh, right from where you're talking about, yes. probably an acre and a half of streets to a development back in 2000 and it went belly up and so we didn't and you put it together you said and we didn't have a reverter clause in there shame on us so we gave up streets and i think wills fargo or somebody but ended up with it and then it turned back into development so and and we've done the same thing on the other side of tarpon point and i just learned of that uh, a month ago that we gave up part of uh 6th street uh all the way down to the river. I didn't know that until our city survey went and said, yeah, we gave that up in 2006. And I went and looked at it, and the council voted for it with no reverter clause, and so now we've given that up. And I don't know why we don't put those reverter clauses in, because well, I'm sure we're just giving away land, you know. I'll do it. Well, thank you. Um, one question, sir. Um, I don't believe you and I have ever met. No. And we've never spoke. No. So, you know, I mean, this is new information. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> I had to look at your um, name, but I'm not So, 
you know, to me, it's about, and I get a lot of phone calls and people will say the same things. Oh, I've heard this, I heard that. Yeah. Um, people send out emails with false information and different things of that nature. And, mm -hmm. and again, when you're in a propaganda type thing and in a neighborhood, it's tough when you're yes. doing that. And, and again, I wasn't around in the two, early, two, I was here, but I wasn't on this council or involved in any of that. So there's a lot of things that we've learned that councils did at that time didn't seem, you know, that maybe you should put a reverter clause, but I agree with that. Well, with there's the marketplace and how it is, right. you, nobody has a guarantee. Right. Guaranteed, and probably, you know, any project that comes to this city, whether I see it or whether others see it, it changes numerous times before. And again, you're always trying to get that best bite at the apple when yeah. it's finished. And then when you realize at the end, it might not be but everybody's totally gonna finished, win. right? So, so I agree with, I'm glad. I, I had no clue who you were or what you were, but I appreciate you being here and, and kind of clarifying some of that. Yes, one, la sir. one last question. Uh, uh, please reach out to me and so we can uh, immediately take care of this and make sure that our river walk stays intact to cooperate with you, not to <coughs> fight against you. That's yeah, not we, my we intent. Want to be, uh, part of the Absolutely. We want to partner, yeah. not, not, not say, you know, I know this sounded contentious and because, you know, sometimes when you don't know, you don't know. Yeah, and what you don't know is it makes you lay awake at night, you know? Worse and then yeah. yeah. The best. And that's but, where I would hope yeah. people would take the facts because the facts matter when yes. it comes down to the, the truth. Well, the facts do matter, but um, uh, Mr. Callan does, Callahan is working with you. Is that yes. correct? Okay. So he, he, he is the medium with you develop it back to the city that used to be the city administrator for 25 years yes. that I'm not so sure. Is he allowed to do that, Mr. Riddicell? Are you allowed to leave a, a city administrator position and go be a consultant to the land development in the city? Uh, well, I, I don't advise Mr. Callahan of his legal issues. I, I'm uh, saying from our perspective. Well, that is something we could look at if, if, if that's an issue. I'm not aware of any prohibitions. Well, I know there is, uh, I've read the statute and it's a little bit fuzzy on municipalities. I know it is that you can't become a lobbyist and you can't uh, do certain things that, that may come back before the council. And th that looks to me like that should be hands off. But again, I would like to have your opinion on that. Um, and maybe a, a um, because of, of maybe conflicts, maybe a, um, uh, a conflict attorney's opinion and, and if, if, if you need to have a vote on that I'd be more than happy to make a motion otherwise I think it's just something that I'd like to have and if nobody wants that then say so otherwise I, I would expect that he would do that well I don't believe mr. Callahan has come in front of us for anything since he's left here so I don't know that right now that's yeah, we're way too far off to even present anything at this right. time yeah. you know, it's just too much well my question to is to the to our city attorney okay so he can so uh, is that uh, is that something you can handle? But, yeah, we can look at that. I mean, like I said, Mr. Callahan hasn't come before this board. He has not, but he's come to a councilman, councilman and others. Right. Okay. We, we can look at that issue. Okay. I, I'd like to have a, 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 an opinion on that, a, right. a, a, Thank le you a for legal your time. opinion on, yes, on that. All right. Moving forward. Um, I'm going to ask Mrs. Singer to come up at this time, um, and I'm going to kind of adjust the agenda a little bit so we work to the Planning and Community Development Director for the Dover Cole presentation before we go further on the docks. Thank yeah, you. we would. Uh, uh, we have uh, Mr. Joe Cole here uh, to make a presentation on his preliminary findings. Uh, he's been talking to uh, various members of the community regarding the form-based code. Um, and what kind of tweaks and changes. This is a, basically a report card we've asked Dover Cole for. They were the originators for our existing form-based code. Um, and it's been <coughs> approximately 11 years now since that was implemented. Um, so we thought it was a good, good timing to come back because we have heard from the community, the development community in particular, uh, that there may be some, you know, some things that could be tweaked and changes to make things a little bit easier. Uh, and more beneficial. So um, with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Joe Cole uh, with Dover Cole uh, to make his presentation. Good morning. Good morning. I've become so, uh, I'm Joseph Cole with Dover Cole and Partners, um, uh, 1571 Sunset Drive, Thank you. Coral Gables, Florida, uh, 33143. 
Um, let's see, to advance slides, just, sorry. Can't talk without slides, it seems, anymore. <laughs> uh, become too adapted. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure, and thank you so much for allowing us to come back with this opportunity to review the work. Um, and so I have, uh, as Robin was saying, I have been talking with a few folks and a, f a few of you council members as well uh, and hearing some of the initial comments. So today I was, I've just got a couple slides. I, I see this more as a discussion um, more than a, a report, uh, but I have a few points that I could, I can bring up uh, in here as well. Uh, so <clears throat> the first thing I like to do is remind people that, um, you know, zoning's only been around about 100 years. And there's so many wonderful places that were built before zoning came into place. And I would put all of the beautiful older buildings in Bradenton in that category. There were no, they, they just did it. So how, how did they do it without these rules? And a lot of it was just common sense and people did, they built things that uh, similar to what they had seen in other places. Uh, the technicians knew how to build the foundations and put the windows in and et cetera, et cetera. And that's the legacy that they've left behind. And so the challenge with uh, the form-based code was how do we extra how do we now create rules uh, for buildings and development that were built at a time when it was just common sense. Um, and so, um, so, so what we like to do is make the analogy to uh, any kind of sports team. Is there's a certain rules? They're the rules of play, and zoning is is what is doing that. Um, but just knowing the rules doesn't necessarily you can win the game. And so I think a lot of the criticism and, and notice, things we've noticed about some of the buildings that were built with the form-based code is that maybe they didn't have the best playbook. Um, and so there's so much in, there was so much written into the form-based code to basically try to make it as easy as possible. And so I'm, I'm disheartened hearing that some things aren't so easy. So I'm very uh, uh, intrigued and, and, uh, and willing to kind of boil down what it is in the book, uh, in the rule book, uh, that we can uh, make things easier because that really was the intent. Uh, and so just like any sports event, you want to do a little um, uh, you want to look back at how the play worked and see what was good and what was bad. And so the same thing works with urban form. Uh, we can look back and see what worked really well and what didn't. Uh, and so I wanted to just, I was looking at the old slideshow we had from uh, a few years back. And so I, I just thought um, since some folks didn't know how long the form-based code had been, uh, been around, um, this was a timeline that we had prepared, I think, for our last presentation uh, to the council. Um, but the, uh, the, the pr prior to writing the form-based code, the city had done a lot of work uh, trying to visualize and decide what they wanted downtown Bradenton, Bradenton to be. Uh, and so that was happening in the, and then we, uh, that was happening through the Realized Bradenton uh, Master Plan. Uh, and so uh, we took the information from the previous planning efforts and through a couple workshops. And that's uh, where we were hearing uh, what folks really liked about Bradenton and what they wanted more of. Um, and so it's, uh, it's about a little, almost 10 years old, uh, or sorry, almost 11 years old. Um, and so uh, during the process of writing the code, we put down maps and photographs and, and walked around and we asked folks uh, to identify what buildings in Bradenton do people really like. Uh, and, and same thing with streets, what streets uh, are, are desirable. And so what our job was to, go, was to go in and start to measure those buildings and see what they look like and the details that they had on them so that we could basically write this rule book uh, to recreate that. Uh, and so even in, uh, in the Downtown by Design uh, book, there were illustrations that showed what, they would, what um, uh, the folks drafting that uh, and were, uh, were representing what they'd like to see uh, and then also comparing that with the photographs of what's there now. So from that, we were able to say, okay, 
um, what we see are shading devices on the streets and storefronts with glass and windows and the buildings are positioned closer to the street and there's on-street parking and there's a mix of use and there's all those little details in there that were not guaranteed under the current zoning at the time. And so again, that was the fuel that went into drafting it. So really what in kind of planning terms now, what we would call uh, the folks were looking for uh, for Bradenton was a walkable community. They wanted a walkable downtown. And so we, it's really easy traveling around to see what those kinds of characters, uh, characteristics are. Uh, and so um, as you can see in the photographs, there's doors and windows facing the street and there's sidewalks and there's fences that have buildings are closer together. Um, there's a variety of architectural styles. Um, so it's very clear and, and it's, and so I think part of that interest was that we are in so much of America and Florida, we are not getting that kind of detail and, and love for community. So it, it was really about how, how do we make Bradenton so unique and different. So what I've been hearing so far, um, and you can interrupt me with any of these, I'll go, th go through these points. These are kind of the key things uh, we've been hearing so far that are kind of falling into these categories. Um, there's certain architectural requirements and, and, and uh, maybe the building positioning of how wide a building a house needs to be on its lot. Uh, a lot of parking and driveway location comments. Um, and then there's um, just sort of confusion about the code itself. Uh, so the frontage requirement, that's basically saying if your lot is 50 feet wide and the, and the requirement is 50%, let's say, then the, 20, your, the front of the building has to be 20 feet wide, 25 feet wide, right? Um, and so um, it looks like uh, in just comparing all of the variances that have been given for single family houses, they're mostly within the T4 zone and they're all single family houses. So that's something easy to fix. It's like um, probably, you know, we were thinking that T4 at the time was going to perhaps become more multifamily. And in that case, you might want it. But I think the solution is simply just to change that percentage or remove the percentage for single family houses. <coughs> and I think that would make all of those variances on <coughs> this <laughs> just disappear. Quick question, should we sure. do that on, uh, uh, as a incentive for affordable housing? Uh, that's been mentioned that, that you know like square foots and, and this that's that an only only with uh, homesteaded affordable housing versus just uh, uh, development well it's it uh, th that's certainly possible the thing that it looks like like in this photograph for example uh, what we're seeing is the house had a requirement of 60 percent frontage uh, so what we're seeing is the driveways are getting really positioned right up against the side of the house and and that seems to be un just uncomfortable when you're trying to open the car door uh, with a solid wall uh, this lot might have been a little bit wider i can see some hedges and whatnot but on this on that far side against the fence um, but so what we're doing is we're basically pushing the house to be so wide that we're maybe squeezing down the driveway and deep and landscaping along the edge so you know, if that house could have been a little bit narrower, then maybe that would kind of fix a lot of the problems and the complaints. Um, you know, the, the, the frontage requirement is really more important for streets where we are, where we're going to have, where we want to create safety f and there's going to be a larger number of people walking down the sidewalk. So in a more commercial or mixed use area, you really want to build out as much of the street as possible. In this case, I think maybe it was an oversight. Um, and so I think it, when, as we jump into this, we'll find a, a lot of little details like that that, that could easil, easily be fixed. Um, another one we're hearing is uh, we have just one little paragraph in, in the architectural requirements that applies to all styles uh, that basically says, you know, this, when you're positioning windows on a facade, then we want the solid part of the wall to be just as wide or wider than the window width of the window itself. Seems kind of harmless. It is a good rule for, for doing traditional design. Um, but uh, but I, we have seen that there have been some changes to that. And certainly if we're doing narrower houses, it's a little bit harder to get windows. And I heard a comment from one builder that uh, they didn't want to even, they just 
they couldn't figure out how to meet that rule, so they decided not to put a window in there. <laughs> so, so um, you know, this is is also probably an easier fix. Do do um, I think the facade that where they met that requirement looks better? Yes. Do I think the part of the building or another facade that doesn't meet that looks horrible? No, I don't think it's so horrible. So. You know, that could be in the realm of uh, a recommendation, a guideline, um, and again, an easy fix here would be to change the word shall to should, and then instantly it becomes a guideline. Um, which also kind of begs the question if, um, maybe if the staff isn't comfortable with reviewing a lot of the architectural detailing, and because that is such a strong part of the document, then either we do one of two things. We dial down the architecture, or we maybe it's maybe it would be a good idea to have uh, an architectural review board review the buildings as part of the process, because um, maybe they can help guide some of the engineers or architects uh, or builders uh, to to do to to make those kind of quality judgments. So you know, if I was saying you know. If I was looking at the window that was a little closer to the side, I would say, is it not possible to slide it over a little bit? There might be a good reason why they couldn't, but there also might be a, just, it's something they just didn't think about uh, when they were designing the building. So I think there's that kind of work. Then there's things that I just don't know how you can, can capture. Um, so uh, the picture that's on the left is uh, a recent uh, house. And so it's falling within the Mediterranean style of architecture. And so even in the illustration that uh, is this apartment building um, off of 9th Street uh, shows you, you know, the style of it. Now that building was probably built before zoning rules, like I said, and it's really a very beautiful <laughs> building. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, doesn't, you know, it takes, I don't even know if there's parking on the lot, you know, because <laughs> it was built before parking requirements. And, um, so, um, and it's, I don't know, even know what the density is, but it's, you know, almost uh, taking up the entire lot. And I don't think anyone hates that building, at least I hope not. Um, but th this, you know, so the, the code, the reason we were put so many photographs and illustrations in there is that it was trying to serve as kind of a teaching document as well. Um, so hoping that the, the builders would uh, do a great job. So you know, so things I would I noticed here that probably an architect would pick up is that in the in the original style, what they would do is they'd have at the corners uh, and certain places in the facade, part of the parapet wall would poke up a little bit, uh, and and then you would put tiles in the middle. So this one in this case, uh, and the tiles are running perpendicular to the wall, not uh, <coughs> parallel to the wall. And so for me, I see that and it just looks, it's not wrong, it's just a little clumsy. You know, it could have been just if they rotated the tiles 90 degrees. The co extra cost that would drive up is a few more tiles and maybe a little bit. And then if I would have raised the, the column, the pier a little bit. And you can see that in this other example that we put into the code uh, of the a smaller uh, band of tiles there. So those kinds of details are really can be fixed by a little bit more coaching uh, which again maybe brings up the reason why we might want to uh, introduce an architectural review board or a town architect or something like that. Um, I, there's a, a lot of complaints about um, parking in the back, uh, certainly when there's no alley because there aren't a lot of alleys. Um, and in the code we allowed, in the, again in the, I think the T4 areas, uh, narrow lots. So maybe we were just naive in thinking that if your lot was really narrow, you wouldn't, um, uh, you'd be able to just simply park on the side of the building. Um, and again, maybe the frontage requirement was like getting in the way. Uh, we were probably thinking if you owed, owned a bunch of lots and you were gonna put a series of houses side by side, the blocks are not so big in Bradenton that it wouldn't be hard from the side of the, the side lot line to run a, a, a shared driveway down the back. Um, an older, we also look at older cities where, they, where they'll do this and they'll share a driveway uh, from the street uh, to the back of the house and then there's more space for cars to be able to turn uh, if they put the parking in the back. So, um, so that's something we're hearing. I don't, I don't have an easy solution for that. Um, there's also, you know, the situation where people have more cars and the narrow driveway 
uh, may not fit, or and I don't know if this was a, a newer building following the code or not, um, but, um, and people have bigger cars as well, and so they're parking on the grass. Uh, and so, um, you know, so I, I guess the question then becomes, is there enough street parking to cover it? Um, and I noticed that some people aren't parking on the street, uh, so uh, when there is probably space. So I th I'm thinking that, you know, part of the solution in, in every community, it's not just the buildings on pro private property, which the code regulates, but it's also the d design and character of the streets. And maybe par and some of the neighborhoods to address the parking issue is we really need to start looking at how the streets are done and maybe we need to redo some of those. A lot don't have sidewalks. Again, walkable communities generally have uh, sidewalks. But if the street is not, you know, a busy street, it's oft, often people will walk <coughs> in the street and that is okay. Um, but if the, but we know the streets are narrow. If we were to stripe parking spaces to basically encourage and let people know it's okay to park on the street, um, then um, we're taking away the, the extra space where pedestrians are, <laughs> are walking. So. Mr. Cole, if I sure. could just add something. A, a Many of our properties, particularly in our historic neighborhoods that do not have homeowners associations, are being bought by investors mm -hmm. for Airbnb and RVBO properties, this sort of thing. And many times prior to this council instituting just some minor regulations to try to deal with that, you did end up with people at, at a home that might have been intended for you know, two adults and one, two, or three children, and now you've got 18 people coming to it, and so you get people parking on the, 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 uh, the lawn, uh, you get people taking over parking in the entire neighborhood, which can be an issue. I've also had people say to me, I'm not comfortable parking on my street because of the way people drive down the street. And I've, I've tried without success to talk about how many times if there is parking on the street that individuals driving down the street, I think reasonable individuals driving down the street would slow down a bit. Yes. So when you brought this picture up, that's one of the things that I've heard about in the areas that, that, that I, yes. I mean, we answer to everyone in the city, but yes. in the area that I live in, these are some of the comments that are Yes, and, coming and, forward. and I think those comments are exactly right. Uh, it's, there's certain visual clues that you send the motorist, um, and you know people don't want their car swiped uh, if they're parking on the street and, and the other cars are moving faster. And when we were walking around uh, various uh, streets yesterday, uh, we witnessed some, I didn't know you could get that fast from one, one intersection <laughs> to the next on a residential street. Um, and make that much noise with your car while you're doing it. Um, and, um, but, you know, when you look at the street, there are no cars parked on it, and it's, it's you know, just op clear open and you can do it. And I think that's exactly your point. When it looks like you can go fast and you're in a hurry, uh, then uh, you will. But well, interestingly enough, we had walked to another block and the same car came down the other street, and there were cars on the street and they were driving slower. So I think it <laughs> exactly proves your point. And that's why I think maybe we need to be looking also at the design of the streets more comprehensively. Uh, in the form-based code, that was the reason why we created uh, a lot of street cross-sections. Uh, the, the idea of putting that in was not necessarily that an individual homeowner would be making those improvements in front of their 50-foot lot or 35-foot lot but that it would serve as a guide for the Public Works Department as, as projects come underway to make these streets more uh, multimodal and accessible. <coughs> now we have complete streets uh, guidelines. Um, it's a term that's used by the DOT. There are funding mechanisms avail available under the banner of complete streets. Maybe that's, that's the, uh, the part of the next chapter. It's the sister project of this. I think Mr. McClellan, at, at our previous meeting, um, we had a presentation and that we were looking to do a complete streets, I began believing, or beginning in Mrs. Coachman's ward. 
Yeah. Oh, that's great. Excellent. Yep. Uh, so, the, you know, parking in general is not really a, a, a form-based code issue. It's every community uh, is wrestling with this, especially communities that want to create walkable uh, centers. So, you know, there's, we have as a culture certain um, feelings towards parking. Often my, my business associate, Victor Dover, always says, if you're in a public space and you out the word parking, it's exactly the same as yelling shark at the beach. Uh, everybody has some kind of story to tell uh, and, and some type of uh, interpretation. So, um, uh, you know, we, we were hearing comments about, well, I would like more of a reduction of parking and some comments like we need more parking because, you know, everybody drives trucks <laughs> and or everybody has more cars in their household than, than what's anticipated. So, you know, the, it's, it's always a compromise. So do you want, you know, it's uh, if you take a shopping mall, the shopping inside the shopping mall, it is a it is a well crafted, engineered pedestrian environment, right? And and the reason those streets crank and whatnot is because the people who designed the malls uh, have done enough studies on human behavior to see how fast they walk, depending on how high the ceiling is and what kind of details are in the in the facades. But there's no cars in there, and people are willing to park their car and walk a long distance and then go in there for that experience. But for some reason in downtowns, there's some people that don't mind, and then there's other people who will fight to get the parallel parking space right in front of the place that they're going. <laughs> and I don't know how we overcome that. Um, sure, sure, sorry. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, chime in on this a minute uh, with uh, Councilman Barnaby's um, comments that uh, and and what you're saying <coughs> too. this is this has come up i know um it's come up in an area uh that i live in an older historic area that's that's revitalized itself and um it was built i mean when we're doing form-based codes it looks like to me like what we're doing is going back to the original plan kind of uh, new urbanism kind of stuff and um a lot of older neighborhoods you know were built smaller lots smaller homes and and the parking and there's street parking and i know the city several times has wanted to in in my area and such um take uh one one side of the street parking eliminate half the parking um my argument has always been and I, it was instructed to me by uh former police chief razalowski that if you want to slow people down you park on the street and 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 by god it works i mean it really does and i am in an area where people want to jump off Manatee Avenue and see if they can hit 60 on a back street. Um, and when the cars are parked, uh, it might make it a little harder for trucks to get around and all, but they shouldn't really be in there, uh, except for the city trucks. Um, but uh, it really it really does uh, slow vehicles down and make it much safer. And also you have in areas where, where your density was high prior to um, you know, this, these are areas that were that had cottage garages and stuff. You have a really high density, smaller neighborhood, smaller street, um, and then you've got like Airbnbs added to it now. So you, you, you had high density, and now you've got higher density, and you want to eliminate parking. That just does not work in 2022. You, you can't take parking away without replacing it. So I just wanted to make this aware, because this might come up in the future, that you know we have to accommodate and uh and also as i'm looking at all this this kind of reminds me back into my early studies of uh, uh city planning and, and and took me down the road of new urbanism which i think we're following with this and and, and I, I think it's working well there's a couple of questions i got towards the end um but um you know it was explained to me that new urbanism isn't new at all uh, the first the first new urbanism in america was in philadelphia by William Penn, uh, who was worked for the, he owned the land for the English government. So, and he was only copying what was done in Europe. So, we're kind of, you know, small setbacks. I mean, well, in Philadelphia, there's zero setback. The building wall goes right up to the other building wall, and, and it works with, with uh, you know, housing on above shop underneath. So, we're getting there. I think we're having this conversation of, of a couple of tweaks. I just got a couple that I brought up, but I'm glad it's. 
and and I was involved in this process all the way along. I mean, when the year when the year when the year was started, I was on the citizen year board. That was 2004. So, um, it's. I know this has taken a lot of knocks, but I think it's a pretty good program that we could tweak a little. And by the way, the uh, the photos you keep showing are the um, uh, homes in the Wears Creek area where we've got a, a neighborhood revitalization going on where we bought out an old development. And I know that the, the builder has had a hard time with planning to make it work, but we're figuring it out. Um, you know, and I, I think they look nice. And to be honest, that's those homes are changing the dynamics of that neighborhood. 100%. It's gone. That, that used to be crack town. And now it's, those homes are selling for a half a million dollars a piece. Right. Wow. Um, All right. So, yeah. So, and then there's one more issue um, that is, uh, is kind of conf code confusion, which uh, again, I felt, feel bad hearing this because the idea was to make things as simple and understandable, or which, uh, excuse me for the uh, any land use attorneys here, uh, was to not have to hire a land use attorney to understand what you could do with your property. <laughs> um, and so, um, I, so I'm really intrigued to see how that uh, can, uh, how we can fix that. And I think probably it's just maybe we need to um, spell out the process a little bit more clearly. Um, to make it kind of kind of like uh, first you should first you should you know I don't, look at this section then this section will help you do x y and z uh and uh and and work that uh, and then and then the approval process just make it all very clear maybe it's a little flyer uh that can be made uh or it's a, a section that appears at the beginning of the code itself uh, like how to use this code um and then um <coughs> Uh, you know, maybe uh, what I'd like to do is kind of go through and see, okay, what are the things, which are the core rules that you don't really want to change? Uh, and then what are the ones that are a little bit more subjective and uh, could be softer, interpreted soft, more softly? Right. Mr. Sanders? Uh, yeah, I, uh, thank you. I talked to you for an hour last week. That's right. April 6th. Um, and you, you indicated there wasn't many changes that you would recommend. You know, I think you said something about the, the windows and not not much that you that would you actually change uh, um, from what you in terms of maybe the way it's structured. But certainly, there's probably plenty of things that can be adjusted. And and you know the 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 discussion of the architecture. You know, there's there's a lot in here uh, that about the architecture uh, of buildings that you don't normally see in a typical form-based code. And the origin of that was that uh, the planning director, Tim Polk, at the time was very um, keen on trying to improve the quality of the, ap of the applications he was seeing coming across the counter. And so he said, you know, I said, do you really want to put all this in here? And he's like, yes, I need as much fuel that I can point to as an example of how to do it to try to coach people along. And so probably the, a lot of the problem is we don't have his strength of a coach any longer. Um, and so it's really up to you guys if you want, if, if that's something you, can, you want to handle through a staff position, uh, or if you, you can also hire out outside consultants <coughs> for that, or if you want to you know, institute an architectural review board, or you already have one, right? Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. So if you oh, want to add we, that we to that list, and then maybe even, you know, the, 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 the beauty of this, again, was geared towards how can we make development happen faster? Um, because at the time that we were doing this, the, the community, what we were hearing from the community was they were feeling like Bradenton was getting skipped over during the last development boom and um, everything went to it went to Sarasota. So um, we were trying to speed it up. So there's a lot of administrative approvals. Um, and again, a lot of that is subjective uh, material. So, you know, maybe, uh, maybe, you know, um, after, if, if you're asking for too many uh, exceptions or something, or uh, then it, then you go to the architectural board. Um, but it's, you know, if somebody came in with an application and followed all the rules exact, then they, sh they um, administratively here, your staff could approve this really quickly. Uh, and that's why that was built in that way. Um, but, if, but if an application comes in and they're still not complying, 
uh, and staff recommends you need to do this, you need to change this, this, and this in order to comply, and then they go away and come back and it's still not done, then it's, you know, it's just prolonging the effort. And in that regard, maybe, um, maybe the architectural review board step might, could speed it up in some cases. It just depends on the personalities. Um, I heard uh, in talking to some of the builders uh, here locally, um, some said, we thought the code was great, it was fast, it was clear, uh, staff was very clear about what to do, and we had no problems. It was almost a love fest. And then on the other side, I heard the exact opposite. <laughs> so so um, again, it's a lot of, it's the personality of the builder, uh, what, um, it's the skill set of their architect or engineer, it's a lot of dynamics. <laughs> Does this have any uh, overlay into uh, looking at our comprehensive plan as far as, you know, what we want and expect mm -hmm. and what the citizens want and expect? It, it certainly could. Um, if, uh, you know, if, if, um, if you guys wanted to make some kind of change that's kind of more drastically different, then might, maybe that might trigger something in the comprehensive plan. Um, usually, Comprehensive plans are updated every 10 years or so anyway. Uh, this your one right now is 10, 11 years old because it was adopted just as we were starting this. Um, so it's probably time to, to dust that off as well and see what's, what might need modification. Right. Or pri and, and often it's prioritization. It's like what kinds right. of exactly. things really need to, right. to be addressed. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I talked to you about that and <clears throat> we would probably have to RFQ that out, but y your firm actually probably. does. does we, we do that. There's a lot of great firms I'd like, I'd like to see well and elsewhere. My comment is I'd like to see that, that done. Are you a believer in the uh, uh, book and, and the author of Strong Towns? Um, Are you I'm, familiar with it? I, I confess I haven't read it, but, oh. um, but I'm, it's certainly in, in alignment with uh, kind of what, we've, what we're practicing as new urbanism. So yeah, it would be in sync. Well, most of it's pretty good, and some of it is, there is like uh, it's a matter of opinion. But it, most of it is is pretty mm -hmm. pretty good. I mean, you, you really know, have to think of your people town really as, expect. Yeah. That, that sometimes you're not getting. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in, you know, the urban, you know, downtown area and that kind of stuff. So. All right. Thank you. I appreciate the presentation. So, so is there any other questions by other council people? Oh, I want. Yes, sir, Mr. Roth. Yeah, um, so in your interpretation of where, where we are, I know one of the strong points was that we wanted to adopt form-based codes to make ourselves more user-friendly, um, you know, maybe, maybe draw a few more builders and everything. Um, I know that the conversation always came back to um, a former councilman, uh, Mr. Gallo, was always bringing back the, that, uh, uh, you know, this, the council should have the right to, um, you know, in, in, in extreme cases, always override. Did that get put in there? Because I, I, I was kind of told where sometimes it wasn't, sometimes, it, you know, and Mr. Polk was very strong about what he wanted, but it was, it was the desire of the council that it be put in there, and I wasn't sure if it ever made it in, and I'm yeah, wondering. The, the appeal process is to city council. Okay, okay. all right. So, I was told it was, I was told it wasn't, I was told, you know. Okay, all right, that's it, thank you. So I believe uh, the timetable is you come back in approximately a month right. or so. Two months, probably yeah. just to, so yeah. we're gonna run around today uh, uh, and uh, take some more photographs and notes on some of the buildings. Uh, we, I still have a list of, long list of folks to, to speak with. I'd like to, uh, if, if you guys would like to speak with me, I sent out an invitation, I can redo it, I'd still love to hear. Uh, any kind of key comments, uh, and uh, then we're going to write up a report uh, and recommend uh, basically what what are easy fixes and what if there's anything that the community really needs to discuss and evaluate uh, and work from there. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Probably and I'll come back. I'll come back pre yeah. to present that. Re report that or present that at a workshop would probably okay. be uh, best. So in okay. a couple of months. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, moving on, Mrs. Melton, can you administer the oath? Anyone wishing to address City Council during the following public hearings will please stand and raise your right hand. 
Do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and representations which you are about to present to this board will be truthful and accurate? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if you want to read the first yes. resolution. Resolution 22-7, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Bradenton granting special use permit number SU.21.5633 to construct a private residential dock up to a maximum length of 120 feet in the T4R General <coughs> Urban Open Zoning District at 1002 Riverside Drive East, Bradenton, Florida, providing for severability and providing an effective date. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, before we get started, uh, I think we need to ask the council if there's been any ex parte communication related to this application. Okay. Has there been any ex parte? It, yes. Uh, April 6th, at uh, 11.37 a.m., I received a call from 551-427-3735. Five, 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 three, five. And I don't know who that person was, but after a few minutes, he introduced himself as a uh, person that's coming before us now, putting in a dock. And I immediately said, I cannot tell you how I vote, and I cannot discuss your doc. And so he continued on talking, but I, I didn't have any specifics that I could allege to uh, of talking to him about the process. I said, you'll have to come to the meeting next Wednesday and present your case. Okay. Any, anyone else? Anyone else? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Myra. Okay. Um, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Myra Schwartz, the planning manager. I'm here to present this case to you and present the facts as I see them. Um, it's a special, what we have is a special use permit request to reconstruct a private dock into the Manatee River. The um, applicant is Tom Glancy of Duncan Dock and Seawall. He's an agent for the property owner, Mr. Kendall McDonald. The property is on Riverside Drive East. It's located at the southwest corner of Riverside Drive and 10th Street East. Um, Riverside uh, Drive does run between the home and the Manatee River. Riverwalk Phase 2 is over here. Um, it begins approximately 150 feet from here um, to the west from the property. Um, and sidewalk and landscape improvements, as you've heard earlier, are soon to begin construction. Um, in, in front of the proposed dock location to the Riverwalk Park. I'm going to show you a plan for that a little bit later. The future land use for the property is Urban Village. The property is located in T4R, your general urban open zoning district of the city's form-based code area. The applicant is wishing to remove an existing dock which is dilapidated um, and replace it with a dock that's a little bit shorter the existing dock is 125 feet long, um, 1,800 square feet, and it has a boathouse at the end. Uh, the applicant wishes to replace that dock with a 120-foot uh, long dock that is 600 square feet and has no covering or boathouse. The side setbacks do exceed the minimum requirement of 10 feet. Um, the dock is shorter. Uh, the proposed dock is to take up less space and less area than the existing dock and it's not attached to any seawall or structure. Um, the <coughs> existing dock uh, was repaired by permit in the 90s and it has been acknowledged by the city. There is no prior special use that I've been able to find in my research or special exception for the original dock, which was probably constructed late 80s, early 90s. The dock, um, the proposed dock has been permitted already by FDEP and um, Army Corps of Engineers. Um, the applicant has provided a deed. Uh, yes, sir. A I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. If you could go back to the previous slide. Certainly. Um, is the applicant just putting in the dock? Will this additional structure around it be coming down? The, the structure that you see in the background will be coming down. This is an overlay um, from an aerial. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Um, the applicant uh, has provided a deed to, to us in his application that states riparian rights. He claims that the land that lies in front of the subject property from Riverside Drive to the Manatee <coughs> River does belong to him. Um, the applicant has also provided a legal opinion uh, by an attorney. This is not a judicial opinion, but an attorney's opinion uh, in support of the property's riparian rights and does cite a, a precedential case. The attorney, Mr. David Levin, states the property owner as the adjacent upland owner who um, abuts, abutting the dedicated street does own fee title to the entire width of the right of way of Riverside Boulevard, um, essentially under the city's road, extending to the mean high water line of the Banatee River. And with that comes his riparian rights. The applicant is therefore only requesting approval for a dock that exceeds the limit of 80 feet in length um, as he is of the position that the dock otherwise meets all requirements of the land use regulations. The right of way permit with public works will be required for any use of um, right of way or the roadway during construction and for placement of the electrical or water lines. That's standard for um, a dock that does cross the right of way in this case. It's questionable whether that will be necessary. Um, this is a <clears throat> depiction of the original plat of C.E. Wilder's subdivision, about 100 years old. Um, <clears throat> the applicant uh, is claiming property, as you can see, just to illustrate. The lot is a combination of several uh, pieces and complete lots, and um, the deed does read uh, as this is described or depicts. The existing dock was repaired by a permit, as I said, in 1992, <clears throat> and I have not found the original um, permit for that, but it is, um, or for the original construction of the dock. As I said, I could not find an original special use. Thus, that person is here um, requiring a special use for this length. Um, <clears throat> Riverwalk, the Riverwalk improvements, the property here is, um, along the improvements for phase 2C. Um, the improvements have been approved by Public Works and have, as you heard earlier, are to begin any, any time. Um, in front of the property is Bahia grass and also included with those plans is a sidewalk connection to the dock. Um, it's my understanding from the project manager uh, for the um, Riverwalk connection that there will be a boundary um, knee wall with railing and they do propose a gate or an opening to be constructed through that proposed boundary railing to accommodate this dock. <coughs> this is, <coughs> this demonstrates the construction of that block and railing wall. You can see there's a, about a, a knee wall about two blocks high, two or three blocks high with a railing above it. And <coughs> across, um, as I said, there are plans to create an opening there for um, access to this private dock. Special use permit is required because the requested dock does exceed the 80 foot maximum length that's required in section 5.1.2.14D of the land use regulations. Um, <coughs> docks and piers may be erected beyond the mean high water line of public waterways or beyond the shores of ponds or lakes over an acre in size subject to uh, the following and included in that in a public waterway the maximum length of any dock shall not exceed 80 feet or 25 percent of the width of the waterway or closer than 25 feet to the center of the public channel which adds ever is less and of course in the Manatee River um, 80 feet is going to be the limit. Um, all special uses um, are required to comply at minimum with certain standards. The um, standards uh, for docks, there are five standards for docks. It does refer specifically to docks that are separated by, uh, from a water body by a public right of way or public property. In this case, um, three of them do still apply. Uh, number one, uh, shall not be attached to any seawall or other structure. The proposed dock is not planned to be attached to the seawall. Number two, setbacks uh, must, um, setbacks as specified by DEP must be complied with in the design minimum of 10 feet and the stock does exceed the side setbacks. Um, property owner will sign a grant of easement for usage of the waterfront and um, construction of the dock and specifies that if the city of Bradenton deems the removal of the dock necessary it will be removed at the property owner's expense. This is not required for a property that has direct riparian rights and would not be applicable um, 
for a claim of riparian rights in this case. The dock pier or appurtenance will be compatible and appropriate with adjacent properties or other properties within the district. On this stretch, there are two other docks. There is one on the corner property um, that has been there for some time. Uh, there is a small um, uh, observation dock on this, which is a private property that also has riparian rights. And there is, if we uh, move over to the east, the proposal of a dock for the river walk, which will um, extend further. So it is in character with the um, existing and proposed docks. Um, and lastly, the dock pier appurtenance must be approved by DEP before uh, issuance of a building permit. Um, this dock has already received FDEP approval and ACOE approval. And that has been provided. I have that on file if anybody wishes to see it. Um, staff's recommendation. Staff finds that the applicant has met the requirements of sections 3.3.1 and 5.1.2.14 of the land use regs and recommends approval of SU 215633 with the following stipulations. Number one, the dock shall be kept in good working order and condition to not degrade from the value of nearby properties. Number two, that lighting shall be according to DEP requirements. Any extension of water or electric service to the dock um, will require city right-of-way permitting. Again, um, it, it should require right-of-way permitting because it will be crossing the city's roads. Um, the applicant shall work with Public Works to design access to the dock over Riverwalk improvements. Um, plans for access shall be included in the construction permitting. If this is approved, then those plans um, will be required to be seen in the building permit. Um, and as we said, uh, they have already been in consideration. Uh, number four, an as-built survey will be required upon completion of the dock to ensure that setbacks are maintained throughout the length of the dock. Should the side setback be less than those as approved by FDP <coughs> ACOE, then the dock will be reconstructed as needed to meet the setback requirement. This is um, a stipulation that staff is recommending for um, pretty much all docks that are going to be constructed in the future to avoid conflict. Number five, all other applicable state or federal permits shall be obtained before commencement of development. They already have their um, state approvals. Um, Planning Commission did meet in public hearing on March 16th and unanimously recommended approval of SU 21-5633, also resolution 27 22-7, for the requested extended length. And they also included at the recommendation of the city attorney um, a recommendation for approval for a dock separated by the water, um, separated from the water by a right of way um, to side on the air of, on the side of caution along with stipulations as recommended by staff. That's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions. The applicant is present. Questions? <coughs> Mrs. Barnaby? I would just like to clarify that the attorney that has sent <coughs> the letter that you have in your, your information is an attorney with ICARD Merrill. It is not the gentleman that appeared before us today during council comment. Okay. All right, does the applicant have anything they want to say before we go to the public comment? Public hearing? Come forward, please. Uh, yeah, my name is Tom Glancy, and again, I uh, represent Mr. McDonald. I work for Duncan Seawall. We'll be constructing the dock. So um, I think, uh, again, Myra always does a great job of laying all this stuff out for you, but you know, it's, good, it's a good point to mention that um, you know, the existing structure there is one of those very dilapidated old boat houses completely enclosed all the way around that they, um, they no longer allow on the river. This would be a much more unobtrusive structure, um, not playing any, any boat lift at this time, or um, you know, just a, just a dock so he can get out and fish and perhaps have uh, boats you know, come and go if, for the weekend or something like that. So other than that, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, any, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to. Questions before we go to the public hearing? No. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, at this time we'll um, open the public hearing. And I do have one comment or one agenda item public hearing by James Hubanks. Um, and I did speak with our attorney. Um, he had asked for a representative of a group, but unfortunately it doesn't meet the requirements of a group. Um, so you have three minutes as to, to, to talk. Please state your name and address. Yes, James Shebanks. I live at 902 Riverside Drive East. Um, I am 
a managing member of uh, MRW Associates, which owns all the other waterfront properties except Mr. McDonald's and the one on the corner with the other dock. Um, the present dock that is in question has been abandoned for probably at least 20 years. It's been shut off. It's a very dilapidated structure, and we would appreciate definitely if the structure would be totally removed. I know that it's showing as a repair. I'm not sure uh, that it really can be repaired since it was abandoned for so many years without any maintenance or anything of that nature. So I'd recommend that <clears throat> if it was approved that the old structure be 100% removed and start fresh. Um, we uh, own the property down uh, that was uh, related to the right. That's like the viewing dock that was just built that kind of comes over the seawall. Um, we don't think it really adapts too well to what the city's wanting on the river walk. And I'm not sure how much of an interest we have of keeping that dock there. Um, and we do have the same kind of rights that Mr. McDonald has on that property in the vacant lot next to it. Uh, we would recommend that um, if any of us are wanting to have access through the river walk, um, to get to that access, I think that the owner of the property should be paying for the uh, gate that would be required to, to do that. Um, I don't think that would be fair for the city to have to pay for that uh, access there. So um, I recommend not doing it, uh, I think, aesthetically for the whole river walk area. Uh, having a couple of little docks sticking out there is not really conducive to the whole <coughs> making it as uh, beautiful as possible. And that's basically what my recommendation is. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else wishing to speak? Anyone else wishing to speak? Um, well, you'll have a chance in, okay, all right. So we can, should we close the public hearing and then have him rebuttal? He doesn't. That's fine. That's sir. fine. All right, so we'll close the public hearing. Myra, did you have anything else you wanted to say? And then we'll go, okay. Um, I do have one question of you, Myra, though. I thought when we talked yesterday, it was said that this is not a replace, this is not a fixing that dock, it's a total replacement. Yes, that's my understanding, and Mr. Clancy can um, reinforce that. Okay, all right, thank you. <clears throat> yes, that was, that was just my comment, that, that you know, the structure will be taken down and uh, be all new, all new pilings and all new materials. Mm -hmm take all that out of there because if they wanted to keep that dock they could replace one pole at a time and start to repair it I mean technically you could but it's Without you know the pilings are in really rough shape and it, it it wouldn't it wouldn't be it wouldn't be money be a lot well, longer yeah it wouldn't be money well spent so uh, um, but yeah I mean he wants you know obviously he wants to keep a, a nice looking structure out there um, you know as someone who does have riparian rights by ownership of that land directly to that seawall he, he does have rights to a dock. Right. You know, that's, that's not something that, right. Right. Yep. you know, okay. is Thank up you. for Any discussion. Any other questions? Mr. Redisell, you, you've looked at that, and your determination of repairing rights was what? We don't issue opinions on, you know, private property owners' riparian rights, and these are notoriously difficult to establish without a judicial determination. When you have these situations where you have right away and property that, that butts up to the right away, I mean, they've made a, um, what I would call a, a viable claim to riparian rights. Their, you know, their deed says that going back for some time that they have riparian rights, um, you know, the legal argument, I, you know, I don't have any objection to what they're saying, let's put it that way. But that's not to say that, you know, the city could could come in and, and make a case that they don't have riparian rights. Um, they have not asked for a special use permit related to the um, for approval of a dock without riparian rights at this point. OK, so that that's not before the council. So if that were to ever become an issue in the future, um, that's something that that could still be determined judicially. So this is a special use? Only for the length. Only for the length from the seawall out. So the other is still. Uh, they, they have represented that, yes, that they have riparian rights. If it were ever to be determined that they don't, right. 
but they would have to remove the judicial it. process would have to take place for that and and looking at the deed that i just got or the server or the deed yeah. it looks like it that was typed in after the d land description it was in a different type fo a smaller font looks like as if that was typed in after the fact of the deed okay i mean that's you know that's part of the reason that we don't we're, we're not going to give an opinion. I'm not asking for your opinion yeah. on that. It just doesn't look like it was the same transaction. It looks like it was added later it, because of the different type and lower font. Somebody added a period of rights in, in there. But I'm, I, I, I'm not accusing him of that. I'm just saying I don't, I don't know. It, it, it doesn't appear to be uh, what the original document was. Yeah, and I, and I think, uh, again, I'm not an attorney, but in my understanding of that, and I've been doing this type of stuff for a long time, the, um, you know, Attorney Levin's argument is not that it <coughs> hinged solely on that statement, but going back to the case law and the fact that the original plat does show his property going all the way to the seawall. So the right of way is actually through his property, not sort of vice versa. So, I, you know, again, I've been dealing with riparian law since I worked with DEP back in 2000, and uh, so I, I think he's making a pretty strong argument. Yeah. The chair will entertain a motion. Uh I have a question. Uh, okay. Uh, with regard to, um, I, I think we need a lot of discussion more about the docks and special use permits. But um, his comment about, you know, the gate and everything, it would be nice if they all had some uniformity. I, I mean, who's going to control the access through the, the railing there? I don't know that it sounds good to go up and over. Uh, I don't know how they're going to. That would be do that and whose yeah. cost that would be and should we have uniformity with all of the dock owners okay, let mr mcclum talk and then you can respond to that um i i do think that the presentation that showed the the wall and such is not applicable to this portion of the river walk that that wall design was the one that we asked for kimley horn to develop as an alternative if we wanted to consider not <coughs> having the full height handrail along the, the river walk as it relates to the segment 2C, which is from Manatee Hospital to Tarpon Point. I do not believe the plans include intention to install handrail along this portion of the seawall in this area. All right, you had a response to the? Uh, no, aid? I just, I, I'd say uh, if, if you had anything else for me, I, I okay. thought I'd sit down. Sorry. You can go well, good. Yep. Yep. Anybody else? Thank you. So you just want, we just want uniformity. We don't want some. I, I just want to know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah and whose cost it'll be and so you're saying it's just going to be open it's just going to be like a knee wall and then they'll just step up over it are they going to be allowed to do stairs or i i don't believe there's a I, i'd have to go take a look i can't recall how high the seawall is in relation to the ground adjacent to it but i don't believe there's a need for any steps to get onto it at the, yeah okay less than a foot so okay and there but in the plans that i saw uh, what wasn't it isn't it good for public safety to have a handrail yeah i mean the the walkway that we're putting in is a is a, a walkway we have it all the way around again that was there's there's um a pretty healthy growth of mangroves in that uh, along that general area that are right up against the seawall right. no no not in the area between 10th and 10th Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. That's not 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 where this dock is. Right. But there's vegetation going in along that stretch of land that will provide a, a buffer, trees and such that are going in. So we're going to have to interrupt that and not have a rail. Again, there was never an intention to have a handrail at that location for the seawall. Please don't comment from the audience. Um, yeah, and when you look, the vegetation that's there, obviously, where there wasn't the mangroves, then there's vegetation because the, the sidewalk is off the seawall. Mm -hmm. Yes. Not right up against the seawall. Correct. So that was the design. Because the, side, the sidewalk is being built within the curb line of the existing road. It's not being built north of the existing curb line. And if we want to change the river walk design, that's a different conversation than this dock, I believe. If it's so desired to add handrail in that area, we can certainly get with the contractor and find, get a pricing for it. Well, here's my might slow it down. Yes, well, I'm wondering if the homeowner is going to probably try to make it so that his dock is kept private. That's what I'm saying is 
I mean, he's well, he'd not have doing to anything now. Is he going to have to come back to us for something else, or? Um, not a requirement. For. For his doc, but if you no, like, but if he does, I'm saying because most people when they put their doc, they don't want other people using their doc, so they're going to put something there. I would think we'd want it yeah. aesthetically. Yeah. To control us as we're spending well, so if, much. Well, if it's right on the river walk, people walking or think they can yeah. walk out there, they may think it's a city dock and he's going to want to control that. Well, that's what I'm saying. What's he going to put up? Yeah. Mr. Roth. Why, why don't, if, if this were to be approved, why don't we add to the condition that um, the uh, a, a gate and fence be uh, approved through the fence permitting process so that, so that, we, have reg so that we have regulation over it? Something. You can add a stipulation. I'm surprised he's not putting anything in there. Yeah. Was there a stipulation? I said, no, you can add that's a stipulation. That's what I just suggested, yeah. So that's where, let's see if there's a motion out there with right. that to be added, or if what motion that comes up. So chair will entertain a motion. Um, well, I mean, uh, a short time ago, I had, uh, I had a problem with a dock that did not have um, riparian rights. And um, so my the, the the condition with this one is this person does have riparian rights and it's he's replacing an existing dock that's probably been there for 40 years. So uh, my I, I'm I'm in line with my beliefs of there's a right to build a dock, um, especially as replacing an existing. So um, I, I will make that motion with the condition that. Uh, any any fencing to privatize it be approved through the city for aesthetic I'll reasons. Can are you Discussion. including the stipulations that were placed on the I, in the staff report? Yeah, I mean that, as as a, as approved by you, staff. Well, you that we need to have that in the motion too, please. Right, with all the with all the existing stipulations by staff. Okay, we have a motion and a second by Mr. Roth, and then seconded by Ms. Coker. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll start the vote in Ward 5. Yes. 1. Yes. 2. Yes. 3. Yeah. 4. Uh, Mr. Riddell, should I recuse myself since I had a conversation allegedly with the applicant prior to this meeting? No. Uh, no. The answer is no, then. So the motion carries 4 to 1. Thank you. All right, um, we're going to move to resolution 2211. We're going to, to take a break about 1135. So um, if we can get done, fine. If not, we'll break for lunch and then come back after lunch to finish up the meeting. Okay. Resolution 22-11, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Bradenton granting special use permit number SU.22.0786 <coughs> to construct a private residential dock up to a maximum <coughs> length of 650 linear feet in the R1 single family residential zoning district at 3210 Riverview Boulevard, Bradenton, Florida, providing for severability and providing an effective date. Thank you. Okay, Myra Schwartz once again, uh, planning manager. Um, this is going to be short because there was a typo in the advertisement for this particular dock staff um, is recommending a continuance to date certain of April 27th to make that correction and the applicant is in agreement. <coughs> Can we ask what the typo is? Yes, it was uh, and I do apologize for this. Um, Riverview Boulevard is not east. Riverview Boulevard does not have an east or west and east was advertised. So in, to be clear, um, upon the recommendation of Mr. Rudisil, um, to be conservative um, about this and to make sure that there are no issues, even though the parcel ID is correct, everybody knows that Riverview Boulevard does not have any designated east or west. Just in uh, uh, the interest of dotting our I's and crossing our T's, staff does recommend that we move this to two weeks from today. April 22nd. April 27th, yes. Mr. Chairman. You need a motion for that? I'll make the motion that we continue this request uh, for resolution 22-11-SU.22.0786 to the meeting that we, a regularly scheduled meeting of April 22nd. Okay, motion and a second. 
27. Uh, okay. Oh, it's 27? Seven. I'm sorry. Seven. 27. 27. Mr. Can we have a motion and a second, Mr. Rudisell? So, first of all, just to clarify, we're talking that it is being continued April 27th at 8.30 a.m. or as soon thereafter as may be heard in these chambers. Um, and we should open the public hearing, and if there's somebody here who um, who may not be able to be present at the April 27th meeting, they, they should have an opportunity to make their comments now. All right, so do we need to? We need, let's, I, I would recommend we go ahead and open the public hearing right. first before we okay. take action we'll on take the continuance. action on the motion. All right. All right, so at this time, we'll open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak on resolution 2211? Anyone wishing to speak? Anyone wishing to speak? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Well, nope, nope. No, we'll leave it open. We'll leave the public <laughs> hearing open, right? I will do Motion that. to continue. So the public hearing is or still open on the motion to continue. So um, we have a motion and a second, and we have a question. Okay. Uh, question. Do we have to, we have to re-advertise it? Yes. And we have to repost it in the neighborhood? Uh, if those advert, if those and send out, well, notices. since the advertisement went out with the wrong address, we have to go to how many, 400 feet or whatever it is? 300, you have to do that all again and then re sign, re put the sign back up again, I guess. Okay. That's the only question I have. Okay. All right. Um, we have a motion by Ms. Barnaby to continue to the next meeting on April 27th, 2022 at 8 30 a.m. or therefore immediately after the meeting starts. Um, so we'll start the vote in Ward 1. Yes. 2. Yes. 3. Yeah. 4. Yes. 5. Yes. Carries unanimously. All right. Um, since we got that done quick, I think we'll jump to Mr. Perry. Thank you, Mayor Council. Uh, before you under Section 7 new business is a uh, recommendation for award for bike scooter share program pursuant to RFP 22-013 TWS. Uh, that recommendation of award is to Bird Ride Inc. And uh, Ms. Tammy Spielman from Purchasing is here. Uh, if there's any specific questions on it uh, as it relates to the RFP, the process, and the selection. What, what is it, sir? Bird, uh, it's for the ride share. Scooters and the scooters. Electric, electric. Yeah, there was, there was two, right? Two, 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 two. Yes, sir. My understanding is that there was two people that actually um, submitted a proposal. There was several uh, that, and, and Tammy knows the specifics. There was several that uh, the package was sent to that it, that it initiated some interest, indicated some interest, but ultimately, I think it was it was two people that proposed. Vero, Vero Ride and Bird Ride. Yes, it was two, Vero and Bird. Um, there again, we posted on Demand Star, which is a national um, posting for public solicitations <coughs> nine people downloaded the documents however we only had two and we sent it out to 400 and 459 and two responded we had a committee of seven who ranked who evaluated and ranked the proposals there were presentations and a demonstration and the committee came at the um, conclusion that bird was the best for the city mr. Any questions Ms. Barnaby can I ask what what do you think was the d the tipping point or the deciding factor or factors that led the committee to select this group over the additional group well as a procurement as the purchasing manager I just facilitate like the committee it was very close I like a half a cent <laughs> very close in in the voting and the numbers came out for Bird. Okay. Thank I think you. One of our board members, or one of those committee members, is here. If you don't yeah, Lieutenant know. Wallen is here, who who has a long history with this. Uh, he provided the technical report initially um, on the program, and perhaps is probably most knowledgeable than anybody on this subject, if there if there is such a thing. Lieutenant Wallen. Thanks for the high pressure on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, to answer your question on that. Like she said, that they were both very, very close. They both had their pros and cons. Each member of that committee had their own reasons 
why they picked Bird or Vio. Uh, I think Bird was overall six to one, the choice. For me personally, um, they seem to have the technology to work within our current bit, 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 bit structure. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, in the report, we have no major bike lanes. We have no major pedestrian bike and scooter friendly barriers here where Bird had the technology to guide scooter riders around that to, to make it safer. Okay. So that was for me. Thank you. Mr. Yeah, questions? Yeah, um, I just read an article in the uh, Herald Tribune Sarasota paper about their awarding a contract. It might have been with Vero. Um, but anyway, what they were what they were focusing on was the um, uh, the maintenance of the bike that they they'd uh, um, that they basically had personnel on on staff that were going to service the vehicles as a ver as a, as a as opposed to like uh, virtual workers. I mean, they made a pretty strong case of why why they chose a company over that. So, um, are, are these? Uh, the, the dedicated the dedicated on the ground employees that are going to like take care of the bikes and also there was uh, um, as far as uh, the batteries were for the other company were um, basically instead of rounding all the things up and going and charging them that they basically could just come switch out the batteries uh, made it really uh, basically the company was I think it was uh, Jack <coughs> and, and Sarasota just got it that they made a case of why they chose why they chose their company, and right. uh, I'm I'm wondering if we've looked at those things. To answer your question on that, we did. We looked at both of those. Both companies do have personnel on the ground that this, this one does that service their scooters. Um, Bird, if I'm correct, they, they they use like a contract franchise kind of model to where they don't have their own company employees do it. They hire locally and then that per person will then have their own employees service charge and do the bikes and stuff um vo they have their own the power process they have their own personnel that do that here um with the batteries vo did have the swappable the swappable batteries um that was a pro for them uh for bird they currently don't have that in their current model however they do have it uh, in an upcoming model so for them, they can't say, well, "Well, we'll give you the swappable batteries," but they will be coming eventually. And what, what, um, um, and what was the comparable? Um, I mean, as far as pricing and everything goes, uh, values-wise, they. As far as the ride. Well, cost? I mean, no. As far as far as our end of it, are they they're both offering us uh, money for the franchise, or? We would not be running the franchise. Okay. Um, Bird did have like a cost share where we do get a small portion back. The O didn't have that, but the city of Bradenton wouldn't have any responsibility in managing the, the no, scooters. No, what did we, did the taxpayers get anything out of this other than just handing over a contract? Does the city receive a fee? I, or Mayor, if I could address yeah, that, Councilor Roth. It's in the report. Uh, yeah, it's in, it's in the write-up. Uh, we would basically ask for a recommendation of award and allow us to go back and negotiate what's called a revenue share. Yeah, and the okay. revenue share is the component uh, that would return uh, the you know the, the positive fiscal impact and monies to the city. So it'd be the same amount. Either either one would be that. Well, I'm, I don't think Vio had that. I don't in think their that they, they right. didn't offer it in their report. Ms. Coker. Well, it sounds like it was public safety that got them selected. For it, me, it was for, for you. Yeah. So I mean, uh, I would. I'm ready to make a motion, and I hope this gets started as soon as possible. Um, so I'll make a motion to award RFP 22-013 TWS to Bird Rides, Inc., and authorize the city manager to pr pursue a contract. City Administrator. City Administrator. Well, what did I say? Manager. Oh, sorry. Don't give him a promotion. He didn't. All right, is there a second? <laughs> we have a motion. Is there a second? Oh, wow. Second. Yeah. All right. Any further discussion? Yes. Mr. Sanders? Um, first, I think we should see a contract with the numbers in it before we uh, get too far ahead of ourselves. I suppose we could amend the motion to say that um, 
the contract has to come back before council for final approval, but then I don't think we have all the information because we don't have an actual uh, price from both vendors at this point is what, what I just heard. It, tell me if I'm wrong. That that wasn't part of it, so we don't know which is the best to make a discussion. You know, we've priced two cars, and, and, and we haven't got a price on either one of them. One's red, one's blue. So We're not buying it, though. We're just allowing them to do their thing. You're allowing them to do one contract, though. That's what this is. Well, and not and not have, if they want to go back with both, then that wasn't the motion, though. You're, you're, you've already selected well, the vendor. I just vendor. don't think we have to micromanage every single little part. I think we've hired an administrator, and we should be able to trust him to do that. That's my opinion. But also our procurement process is there. With That's yeah. what we ask the employees and the process to go through yeah. to do. So right. that's the first part of it. The second part is now the negotiation. And like you said, we've got an administrator that, that includes and, and will be inclusive and We'll do it. So, uh, Ms. Barnaby, you had a question? Yes. Will, will the maker of the motion amend the motion to say that once the city administrator pursues the contract, that the contract can be brought back to us for final approval? Yes. Uh, and the second will agree to the friendly amendment. Question. Mr. Roth? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, um, uh, how, how long is this contract for? Two years. I believe it's two years pursuant yeah. to the write-up comments. Mm -hmm. Okay. With options to renegotiate, uh, right. but but the whole thing, revenue share. Yeah. It's two. It's two years. But what what we said the reason why we wanted to go with one contractor was that if if we if we're not happy with the service, we will cut <laughs> cut them loose. So it's a two year contract. They have a right to renew, but we don't have an obligation to renew. That's correct. I'm not okay. familiar with the. I mean, obviously the the terms of the contract would have uh, termination provisions that are fairly favorable. Uh, both for cause uh, and for convenience. That's all legal matters. Tammy. Yeah. At any time during the term of the contract, for, we can counsel for any reason. Okay. Or we don't have to renew. Uh, we can have, we can actually count, cancel. Correct. Perfect. So Good. May. That, that's great. Um, what about this third party that's being? It's this this uh, organization is franchising this out. Does that? Uh, how does that affect us legally in in the binding of, of if, if you got a third party Bird that's is responsible. I'm sorry? Bird would be responsible. They're responsible for the third party. So yes. and the third party is a is a franchise. It's, say if it was me I'd be a franchise and I would take care of all the local maintenance. So we have to go to Berg, which is located where? They will have a representative here. They will all oh, the I I thought you said they would not. Okay, they have a representative here, so that's our, our contact on the, on the ground here, so we don't have to go through the third party. And oh, no. Where, where is Bird located? I think they're out of upstate somewhere. Um. But I don't think they're not franchising it out. No, they're just I, no, having no, a yeah. jobber pick right. them up and charge them, and it's yeah, going to be it's, local. It's, right. Since, it's just since language and, and precision is right. important, I think using the term franchise is probably not the best right. idea. I, I think it's a subcontractor to Bird. I For think that's it. generally what we probably should generically refer to it as a subcontractor. Um, it is, and I said that as a franchise as an example. Both sure. Okay, thank you. Thanks yeah. for the clarification because there's, yeah. there's a big difference. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve the recommendation for Mr. Perry and then bring back to the council to final approval. Mr. Perry, you had comments before we vote? No, I just will quickly answer a question. Uh, corporate headquarters is in Santa Monica, California. Uh, they're all over the country. I was up in South Bend last week. They actually South Bend had them. They're one of the national leaders. They put together a pretty good package. Um, you may have read. Yes. And, very and, comprehensive. Yeah. And, and, and the other the, the other um, responder was very good too as well. Yeah. They were both both really good providers. All right. So here, no further discussion. We'll start the vote in Ward Two. Yes. Three. Yes. Four. Yes. Five. Yes. One. Yes. Very unanimous. All right, um, we've got about 10 minutes. Do we want to adjourn now, or do we want to go through council reports and then? Mayor, if I could just give a quick report on one other matter, um, retail space, garage retail space. Yep. I sent out a package uh, to all the counselors right. with uh, the overview of everyone that, re that, that 
she had expressed interest and uh, was considered basically and uh, uh, hopefully people have the opportunity to review that and uh, I, I obviously provided the five people that were selected we're in process of finalizing negotiations on the contract with I think the memo that I sent out did include the lease rates for each and every unit um, as well as some other issues and hopefully hopefully we will have people attendance in there by uh, June 1st is, is what we're looking for and although this is a lengthy process from just as recently as the holiday season of December of 2021 when it came before council um, I, I think that it's something that's important that we do right not fast and uh, it, I, I think the people that have selected will add value in alignment with what council had discussed as far as the types of businesses we want <coughs> down on Maid Street so thank you I agree. It looked like a pretty good selection. You know, it was so good. Good job. It's going to be nice. Yeah. I was going to see if they want to go council reports. We could just end the meeting. There's a CRA meeting. We could just not. You can do it. Okay. We could. Um, if, if it's all right, I mean, Councilman Roth asked if we could forego council and department heads for today. And then go right into your CRA meeting and do if, if then there's no specific. As, as as stunning as this may sound, I think they're just fine with that probably. <laughs> <laughs> so all right, I see all thumbs up. So thank you. So at this point, we will adjourn the city council meeting. Thank you. <laughs>